Welcome to Biggest Geekus. We are your hosts. I am Joe. And I'm Randy. This is episode 45 of our podcast, and the date is Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. It is the Colt 45 episode. Oh yeah, baby. Represent. Even yeah, though n- neither of us drink Colt 45. Wait, is Colt 45 a gun too? Uh, yes, and we don't have one of those either because no, they're freaking expensive. Yes, yeah, so I have a couple of guns, but it's uh, not that type. Too. I Much. think a Colt 45 is worth more than my house, probably. For real? I mean, if, if a period one. They're pretty uh, Oh, valuable. I'm sure. Oh, right, right. If you had some, yeah, you had some kind of period weapon that's probably very valuable. I would think. I would think. Yeah. All right. Well, we yeah. have uh, some call-ins and an email. I'll start with the email. Oh, you're jumping right into it. Yeah, I asked how you been, and you ignored me. That's all right. Let's have it. I been? <laughs> we just talked about that before I started recording. You want me to say no. it again? No. No, I'm, right. I'm doing okay. I need a haircut. Yeah. And I've been walking in the heat. Heat walker. Heat walker. I think I'm biking about 400 miles tomorrow. That or, that or 20. Yeah. <laughs> Probably 20. Probably 20. Yeah. Now I should be appropriately sweating like a demon lord all right so um not last week right not the week before that but i believe three weeks ago Mm. uh when we were i think it was the day after may have been the day after we recorded our extra episode Right, so, when we had so, that, that incorporeal week off where no one could really tell because we were so smooth. We were very smooth. Yeah. Yes. Um, our friend Jason, yeah. I mean Josh, sorry, Josh, yeah. Josh uh, sent us an email. Is that our first email? Our our first, uh, uh, apart from the one, the phony one you sent. Yes, that was a good one too, though. Yeah, yeah. Because I believe but, it praises me a lot. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, which is how you know it's fake. so uh josh (laughs) sent us an email with uh some um let's see movie inspirations uh, oh yeah additional movie inspirations oh josh yeah uh for we and jason would get along with movies oh yes definitely josh loved him some movies um and I don't know why he directed it at you in particular because we both talked about it it was about rippers so maybe that's why Right. Uh, if it's about I, role playing, it should come toward me. If it's about other stuff, probably toward me too. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> no email to me. <laughs> um, so for Rippers, uh, inspiring for Rippers, uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Probably. Have you seen that? I, I, I have not. I haven't I mean, either. From the previews, it sounded like it'd be a Rippers style, right level sort of stuff or close to it. Right, right. I've seen Pride and Prejudice, but not and Zombies. Um, and then Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, mm-hmm. which I have seen. Me too. Yeah. Uh, and it's pretty good. I mean, it's even barring the, uh, the vampires, it's pretty, it's pretty hilariously inaccurate in every way. <laughs> it's got some cheese rolling, but yeah, yeah I mean, but, that's okay. That's right, kind of Ripper's right. Clash Deadlands here. Right. But, that's uh, cool. I, I don't know how many people can chop even even through those small trees with one swing, but it's, <laughs> I know. A, it's a hero show, so of course hey, he baby. can. Whatever. He fa- he uh, he discovered the uh, the juice, whatever it was. So yes, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Vampire Hunter, and Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, both good. Okay. Uh, both actually probably good. I know for sure Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. The other yeah. one probably for Rippers. Mm-hmm. It'll be good. All right. We also uh, received an email, and I believe this is because of Josh. All right. Yeah, Josh, I think he knows the dude. We received an email from Brendan LaSalle, who is oh, yeah. the creator of yeah, X-Crawl, Brendan. right? I met him a couple of times, yeah. Gen Con. yeah. Right, so he's the creator of it, right? Yes, correct. Right. That's his game, even though it, who, who's who does the uh, production and all that stuff? Is that Goodman Games? I believe Goodman no. now has he's work. I believe he's working for DCC, okay. and he's like a one I've heard. He's a he's an Iron Man or DMing, and I I know I've seen him at smaller cons even in Michigan. He came to it wasn't UConn. It was another one. Me, Eric, and Josh went to, and he ran a DCC version of X Crawl. Uh, the man's a cool cat. He's a good dude. So uh, 
what he did was uh well josh told him that we gave his uh game a good some good uh exposure on our podcast i mean we talked about it and we gave it a good review good exposure i don't know that's right. probably <laughs> hilar- that's hilarious but that's like my people um brendan appreciates it and he right, uh cool. uh after some exchange and meatheadedness on my part uh mm-hmm. uh he gave us a uh a shout out on twitter which is cool, cool. yeah thanks Brendan. i appreciate it bud yeah yeah very mm-hmm. much appreciate it x crawl is awesome and i will be getting the dc version dcc version for sure yeah cool all righty so moving along to the call-in call-ins the anchor messages we got several oh okay so let me get this all lined up yeah because you want to get where i can hear it not really but i will anyway uh, no. you will put up with it we're gonna you want to tell them we're going to push some of the ones, the negative material plane. Last week, we got a little bit into the negative material plane with stuff. So we're going to push some of the ones related to negative material plane. Not because I think it's necessarily bad, just folks may not want to hear controversial topics and opinions. So we're going to move that stuff to yeah. that. Keep the negative in the negative. Right. Oh, all right. So number one from Jason. Yeah. Hey guys, Jason here, just listening now. I want to pause the podcast to say it's okay to disagree on movies. For the most part, we're about the same, and for the places we disagree, it's not your fault you're wrong. As far as Mud Sword, hey, take my money. Give us your account details. <laughs> yes, and we will take it all. <laughs> we're going to talk about Mud Sword today. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, I'm hopefully going to become a thing. I feel like it's going to. I hope. Yep. Next up is Taylor. Fury Road, the movie with a blind mutant playing a flame throwing guitar atop a Marshall stack with an engine that passes for a truck. Fury Road, the movie that one hour in I realized was just going to be two solid hours of car chase. Fury Road. The movie where an armored and turbocharged Volkswagen bug gets picked up by a cyclone struck by desert lightning and explodes into a blossom of flame sweeping through the wind. This is Taylor of Clerics Wear Ringmail. Had to pause the episode and call in. I bought six copies. One for me, one for my wife, one for each of my siblings, and one for both of my parents. Fury Road. Wow. Now that's a ringing uh, endorsement. Endorsement. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, dude. Six copies. I've seen Fury Road, but maybe I need to watch it again. I don't remember seeing what Taylor saw. That's awesome. (laughs) I don't know what a Marshall stack is. Me neither. (laughs) No idea. But I want to see a VW bug blow up in a a desert like tornado type with lightning and stuff. (laughs) I don't remember that. I don't right. remember at all. Yes. And speaking of, uh, I haven't seen it, so maybe I, I need to now. Um, so Jason's some of Jason's calls are talking about new TSR and Kickstarter. Oh, so maybe we should put that to the negative as well. Probably. Um, and we have some from um, Andy as well that we'll get put in the negative our number one fan our number one fan sweet and we have one from john allen large hmm. hey there guys it's john here from the red dust diaries just listening to your what type of gm are you episode and i think you make a good point where you're talking about the balance between role play and combat encounters i think it's like anything you know if you go to too many extremes you get too much of one or too much of the other it can be not great for some people and i think sort of getting that balance is one of the skills of a gm i mean like you guys were saying even in a traditional dungeon crawl there's normally a lot of like exploration a lot of like finding out about the dungeon and the story behind it and little rp bits going on in there whereas if it's just a kick open the doors like smash the monsters that can be fun for a bit but eventually it sort of 
gets a little bit stale. Whereas I do find if I'm playing a whole game where there's like no dice rolls at all, I do start longing for a bit of dice rolling or a bit of combat. So I think balance is probably the way to go on these things. Anyway, I'm going to get back to listening to the rest of the episode. Great job, guys. I'll catch you soon. Yeah, all this is a matter of taste. And uh, yeah. um, I prefer having dice rolling yep. uh, and doing some uh, exploration, lots of monster bashing, um, uh, plot. All that stuff is good. You have to have some dice rolling in there. I'll get bored. Absolutely. And for me, especially in a dungeon crawl, I want... I want the monster, I want the players to fight, the PCs to fight a lot, but I want them to know what they're fighting. You know, if you're in the Temple of Elemental Evil, I want you to know, you know, you're fighting the members of the air cult versus the members of the fire cult and what the purpose is. You know, um, I don't want it just to be a smash in the door, take it stuff, mash in the door, take it stuff. And every once in a while you have a random encounter, some creature that just lives there, doesn't care about the cult. You know, I'm just a total BA retriever. Uh, I was created by Loth a thousand years ago, and I'm just hanging out here because nobody can run me out. Right. You know, <laughs> so that's okay too. But I, I, I'm with, yeah, you got to balance it out. Make people interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. We do. We do. So we're going to push the rest of them to negative plane just because there might yeah. be some, you know. I don't know that we'll have virtual. much else beyond that. Yeah, I don't. I have nothing. I'm just I'm going to play off whatever they say. So it's probably going to be a call in. So if you just want to hear their comments on either our our comments or whatever, that's the place to do it at. Just in case you know we disagree, and which is fine. No one's going to get mad. I'm going to set about nothing. So it's all good. Yes, we'll probably just include some uh, chuckling at the folks that think that they're changing our hobby uh, yeah. because they deserve. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. All right. Uh, so. Um, we're as we're continuing to the positive material plane with what's up with the 50th, 50th episode. Yeah, I believe we talked before this. I think Joe's got big plans this weekend. He's going to try to get some stuff figured out on the website end. Yes. And I have decided on a few books. Uh, two of them I'm for sure are going to be an option. So here's what I'm thinking. So for our contest where they either, either the first 50th episode, people that call in, we're going to randomly select a name. Uh, not call in they have to put their name their email on the website correct joe yes once you get it once you get it figured out yes and then the, whoever we randomly draw i'm going to send them a book and i've got i mentioned feng shui too that's still a possibility another one i'm going to do is water deep dragon heist the fifth edition adventure um oh and, um, well it's practically new I yeah it looks like it. it it is new because i've never used it I'm not sure I've read a minute, a, a sentence of it. I'm just not that interested in it. And then I'm thinking of an old school thing right now. It's going to be Labyrinth Lord's um, Advanced Edition Companion, but that may change. So I'm not sure if this is going to be it. And since it's going to, they're our very first one that we give out, it'll be our first prize we're going to weigh. I'm also going to stick in an extra special surprise that I'm not going to mention. I'm just gonna well, it, it would be a, a surprise if you mentioned Correct. it. Correct. Surprise. I already mentioned it. No, you're <laughs> right. So I'm going to have a little something else for him. What's so. that advanced edition Labyrinth Lords about? Well, it's basically from what I gather, there's a few. It's funny enough, I noticed the spell identify was in here. There's lots of spells you would think would be in the core book, but, or maybe this is just a few extra spells. Um, um, Labyrinth Lord gives you the play experience of old editions of the game. Is a handbook of advanced player and referee options, play the race and class possibilities. Oh, so you can do race and class combo instead of race as class. I'm guessing original Labyrinth Lord did that. Hmm. And so they have spells, I believe, up to ninth level. Good. I mean, uh, I know a lot of people still like race as class because they mm -hmm. like the very old OD, the OG, yeah. OD and D. I do. I, I do not like the races class. I do like it as a, I'll tell you what I'm thinking with, we're getting into that with, um, we can talk about it now, I guess. No, it's coming later with Mud Sword. I'll talk about okay. my opinion. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yep. All right. So, uh, and we played, no, this is something different. All day. No, we played last week, remember? We did that one. Uh, that was kind oh, of I miss I mistook your sentence there. Yes, we no, played. No, they're, they're they're just random random comments. So we played last week. Uh, Joe was part of it. His wife, our friend Jeff, and our friend Larry. My first play test where I took OSE and um, a little bit of white box, a little bit of um, 
not part yet. I made my own rules for some things. We're going to talk more about that in the mud sword segment. We're going to have a segment on mud sword. I want to tell people where I'm thinking and where I'm going and where Joe's got it. Joe and Jeff are really good, helpful. We had a lot of comments on the magic system, but that was fun just playing. Yeah. It was good to get into the game and play again. Had and fun with the old school. Yeah. And I just made a comment. We're going to be running. I'm going to be running next Wednesday, a week from today. Buddy of mine's having a birthday. The aforementioned Josh earlier in. And we're going to celebrate his birthday. If you guys are coming over about 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm off now. I'm on vacation from work. I teach at a local college. And so we're going to play some Deadlands, which I love. I'm going to play full through a full module, probably play a few hours, take a break, grill, have some food, and then play again until whenever. So we're all pretty wide open for the day. So I'm excited about that. It'd be fantastic. Deal. Yeah. So well, happy and uh, advanced birthday. Yeah, Josh, Josh. Happy birthday, Josh. Anything cool for you that happened this week or you want to talk about Joe and mm -hmm. you excited about positive materialness? Um, well, yes, yes. Uh, so I uh, made a Biggest Geekus um, Twitter account. Oh, wow. Okay. Instead of just promoting it on my personal one. And, there you go. And it went from zero because that's where you start at zero right. uh, followers. And uh, luckily the uh, few dozen folks that are following me, mostly because of the podcast uh, yeah. uh, jumped on board. So went from cool. zero, zero to 60 pretty fast. Oh, how do I get on there? And does got to get Twitter and then join the biggest because if you want, team? if you, if you uh, are a masochist, Okay, yeah, I know. I'm a little leery. You know, ten Twitter's kind of not my bag, but I, I kind of don't want to leave you hanging. I'm, uh, yeah. So, so uh, I think I'm, I okay. think I'm ready for an article. I got my beginnings of one. Okay. By the way. Okay. Yeah. Talk, I'm, I think I'm ready to write something up. So I'll it's intended it for uh, the uh, account is for biggest geekers, not just me. So gotcha. uh, I'm I, uh, I'm going to have that and the anchor, like I said to you. The anchor credentials for you so we can share it instead of me hogging it you are, i'm a hog, hog you are it's all good cool excellent yeah all righty so are we ready to move on to how do you roll yeah so i got this idea joe i listened oh, to no. eric King cars i know you all right yes i'm fine okay i don't know <laughs> you said uh-oh <laughs> i thought something was happening no, so you had an happened. idea. That's what's uh oh. That's pretty yeah, scary. It usually so anyway, means all the player characters are gonna die. <laughs> no, this had to do with uh one of Tinkar's cast. He uh starting up a uh RPG with some of his buddies. Um actually his original buddies from like high school, college days. They're gonna play again. And he didn't know if he was gonna do he was like, I'm not sure I'm gonna do a hex crawl or a sandbox or a dungeon or this or that, or what style his you know game was gonna be the setup. And that got me thinking, and I know there's more than what I've listed. What kind of styles of games are there? And when you pick that style, if it's good, for, you know, is it, is it, which styles do you think are good for drop in, drop out, where it's not as important that the same three or four, five, six players show up every week? And which ones are good for, you know, preparation, when they're easier for preparation, which ones accommodate, accommodate different player play styles best, um, and those sort of things. And I, and I kind of broke it up into kind of uh, what I consider sort of sort of three three big three big things, which was kind of like crawls and then sort of uh, character driven and then plot driven sort of stories. And then I mixed in you know a few other things people know about sandboxes and venture paths. And I know I haven't covered everything. Um, and then I thought we'd discuss those and see what they what what we think about think about. Um, how that works and the things that are good and that are bad about those different styles, at least from our experience. Okay. So the first big category is the crawls, right? The crawls. The crawls. There and are lots argue, of different kinds. There are. And so the first one, of which is the, is the dungeon crawl. And um, the type of scenario, uh, mostly in fantasy role-playing games, in which heroes navigate a labyrinth environment a dungeon, if you will, battling various monsters, avoiding traps, solving puzzles, and looting any treasure they may find. Now, the Wikipedia link that I have on there is actually more geared toward video games, but I like the definition. And that's kind of how, well, 
me and you for sure that's how we started playing dnd oh yeah we, it wasn't what's the next adventure do you have a dungeon ready right that's kind of how we thought of it yeah you know, i got a dungeon ready you want to play you know that was kind of how we did it in the early days oh yeah it was dungeon. dungeons dungeon dungeon yeah so uh what do you think of dungeon crawls just in general i like them do you okay uh, so, not all the time right but uh, i think a dungeon a, a good dungeon crawl uh good dungeon crawl uh gives you lots to do mm -hmm. uh, the dungeon tends to have something for every character type right so it gives you something to do uh used to be in the day if you played a druid dungeons kind of sucked right. for you they but did. uh but um in general, I think dungeon crawls are great because they give you lots to do. Uh, you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of plot to worry about. You just do right. with, do you just deal with what's in front of you. I mean, you can. It doesn't mean you have to have just. It doesn't have to be because you know there are funhouse dungeons that may or may not have rhyme or reason. I mean, think about White Plume Mountain, where Caractus sends this note to the king and says, "Hey, I've hidden these three powerful artifacts in this dungeon of doom," and I'm like, "Good for you." But I mean, <laughs> right. as players, you're like, sweet, Luke, right. let's go get it. That was the whole impetus, you know. You never run into Caraptus was his name, right. but you get, you get Wave and Whelm and Black Razor, potentially, and you face off against all the just crazy different challenges that the Mad Wizard made up or the Mad Dungeon of Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which is popular in 5e, which is basically Undermountain. Um, you do it because it's there. That's usually the mentality, though it doesn't have to be. Dungeons have become more... You have you can have more reasons than do it because it's there. Oh sure. But if you have a player in your group who doesn't like the oh god we're just going because it's a dungeon. I mean it could be hey um, this guy's um, or the, the town's um, holy book the temple's holy book has been stolen by these goblins and they are found in these caves nearby. Sure. You, know, or, you just or put chaos. the MacGuffin in there. Yeah, the caves where chaos dwells. And yeah. so you go in and you head in there and you just got to hunt that book down and you find other things and you may go find the book and go, hey, we've retrieved this, but there's more crap in there. Let's go explore it. If you're, I, th I think if you're into exploration, it's a great hook for most players. Mm -hmm. um, if you're into RP, what do you think about that? Not well, that you're, I, I don't mean crazy, but yeah. someone that like me, I really enjoy good RP, but I do like dungeons. Yeah, I think you can uh, inject RP into dungeons with not even a whole lot of work. You mm -hmm. just, you might need to change a few of the monsters into uh, the, your uh, folks that are, would have an interest in the RP that you have in mind, or mm -hmm. you can use what's there yeah. and just you can use, inject it. And you can RP with monsters. I sure. mean, you could meet, you know, a, an Afridi Sultan who's trapped, trapped down in the dungeon. Mm -hmm. And he says, if... I need these three things to happen. If you do these three things for me, I'll be set free and I'll grant you a wish. Right. And you get the person that can role play. Or you can just try to fight him and kill him. You know, and the guy that wants to role play might try to talk first. So that could be good. I don't know. I'm not sure if this counts as RP, but if you have like, I think of the Temple of Elemental Evil dungeon back in the day, there was the air node, the fire node, the earth node, and the water node. Um, seems like one of them was blocked off from players, but I don't recall. Um, and so those different factions of priests, they priests that followed, worship the elemental, they worship the elemental princes of their element. And so you could like play one off the other, you know, the fire people didn't like the water people. And oh, the you air could people, definitely RP that. Yeah, and, and the air folks didn't like the earth folks. And air and fire was pretty good. Water and earth was pretty good. Earth and fire was a little cool water and air was a little cool so you could play them off each other and i'm not sure if that's the exact case so that's sort of strategy and strategy <laughs> strategy <laughs> strategy i don't think it's a word but yeah you could rp that sure. um yeah so i, I mean uh the, about the only one that we would have difficulty with i think is probably two more horrors because that's just a bunch of traps I well mean, and that's meant to just test your ingenuity as a puzzle solver right right and, and it's basically a death trap anyway i mean yeah yeah i mean there's like rp not required i've heard a few folks i don't i couldn't name them on where probably where i've read it online where they claim they beat the tomb of horrors back in the day the first time through okay it probably happened but i wouldn't say that's based on skill that's based on luck and i'll, I'll that would all 
first time through, I'm I'm sure. I mean, the whole party, or just right part of the party. Succeeded. I mean, I think I think we had a pretty high level. I think you had a high level wizard that survived it by going astral and leaving. You and I think remember Robert's dwarf. I think went through there with some companions, and you two were the only one that lived. That sounds like something that happened. Sounds familiar. Hey, it's been a long. You time. couldn't beat that. You couldn't beat. Spoiler alert. You couldn't beat the Demolich at the end, which really nobody could. You didn't have you didn't you were high level, but you didn't have the right spell. You're supposed to like I think you're supposed to like power word kill him from the astral plane and you couldn't. So you guys just well, left. So you, we just went to the astral plane and said, Bye. Yeah, we're out of here. See ya. Wouldn't want to be you. But um, I mean you can do stuff like 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 that. And I think do you think um you think it accommodates if you like we have a large group of friends. I think a dungeon would be a good way to if you have short explorations, right, kind of go in kind of a West March style where you go in, there's a style and come back out every session. So nobody's left in the dungeon. So it's a hit and run exploration. So the next time, if we don't have everybody there, we got two other different people, they could join in the fun. And the whole point could be there's a town not too far away from this dungeon that kind of helps service a service adventurers who go explore that dungeon. Well, um, Things like that, I mean, not a dungeon, but right. towns used to uh, spring up around uh, where they thought there was gold. Right. In the uh, American frontier, Western frontier. What's the difference? Or there's no there's no of, real difference. If The Hobbit, that town that sprung up around the king under the mountain. There's that town where the where before the dragon came, before Smaug came. Oh, sure. sure that whole town sure. was was like, and the dwarves were like, they were like the kings of the region. People came to trade with them all the time because they just had ridiculous amounts of gems and money, mm -hmm. you know? And so in that one town, start with a D, I can't remember the name of it, sprung up right below that mountain before right. Smaug came and ruined all the crap. Right. So, so, I mean, it's not, it wouldn't be if you accept the presence of the dungeon there and that mm -hmm. it's persistent and that uh, mm -hmm. hard, it's hard for, uh, to beat it, whatever that might mean in the real fake world. Um, so if people go in frequently and they bring treasure out and they go in and come out and over years, yeah, there would be a town just like with the gold rush. Well, you know, and you, it's wealth. You know, I used to always wonder when I first played with dungeons, everybody else did, like the characters beat the monsters. Well, wouldn't they eventually just be empty? But I do think, unless you're just there guarding it, there's two, most dungeons are too, even a basic dungeon has enough entrances usually and more complicated, you know, it's, it's a little bit complicated to, to, you couldn't guard every room very easily. So monsters could find their way in there again. Right. A wandering owlbear go, oh, this makes a good nest. Look, there's all these dead decaying orcs. I don't care. I'll just pile some straw over here and I have my babies over here. We'll just set up here. And that could happen in a couple of days where you're in the town partying. I mean, a big well, owlbear female sure, come along sure. pregnant and just plop right down and have her have her little cubs and be like, this is mine now. Right. And, and then, a scavenger type uh, monsters that eat carrion. And yeah. if there's a bunch in there with dead bodies, it'd be, a, it'd be a refrigerator kind of. Or intelligent races be like, well, oh, good. The orcs are dead. Kobolds go, hey, let's set up shop here. Right. This is cool. They've already got a place for armory. They got a place where you can go to the bathroom and it ain't stinky. And oh, look, there's an audio in the bottom. Perfect. So you could, I mean, I used to think that was weird, but that could actually happen. And it wouldn't take a lot of time. I mean, it would spread. Hey, all the orc chieftain Ugg is dead. And so is all his orcs. Let's go take their home over. Sure. You know, and say, well, who, who killed them? Well, they're not around. They're humans, dude. They're not hanging around in dungeons. Let's go check this out. So yeah, that can make sense. I, I think it's great for a drop-in, drop-out type game. It could be. Could, it could, could also be. be, could be. Consistent. I do think generally it's easy prep for a GM, mm -hmm. especially if, if you use a pre um, a packaged one, if you run Temple of Elemental Evil or a Penithoc, it's already set up for you. So you could like now. I guess if you want to, if you're not, if you don't want to railroad, um, you'd have to kind of. I mean, the players some dungeons, you know, you you slip up like our Penithoc is one of the sub. You know, we're talking we're talking about mega dungeons in a second, but you know if you fall through a pit and land in the second level or heaven forbid go down a, the old classic elevators and they take you down to the ninth level of the dungeon you might be in the, and the players do it you may have to wing it because you maybe you probably not prepped all nine levels but right right 
So I mean, that but mean it's it, it provides if you run one of, one of the old school. I don't know how true this is of the old school modules. I didn't look at them too closely, but Rapanathuk it has lots of entrances, mm -hmm. lots of ways to get from one level to the other without necessarily having to beat everything. And I believe and, lots of hooks to get you there. Right. So uh, that describes something that you put in here later on, particular type of thing. Uh, uh, this one map maker. Can't remember the name of it that you put in here. Anyway, we'll get to it. Uh, but yeah. basically, uh, a very interconnected. Yeah. So it's not like you go in one end and you have to go through all the rooms in a particular order to uh, get to the next level. It's not that linear. That Rapanathic's yeah. not that linear. And there's lots no, of them not. that are like that. Yeah. And good dungeons, I think, are not always linear. Um, I didn't put this in there, but I, you know me, I'm a fan of ranking. On a scale of one to five, one being I don't really like them at all, and five means I absolutely love them, would rather do them. How would you rank a standard dungeon crawl as an adventure for you? Probably seven or eight, at least. Oh, okay. So I dungeon like crawl. Them. Yeah, I, I like them for prep. Sometimes mm -hmm. I get, if you notice, you know, though, I don't run tons of them anymore. Right. I, mine, but though I have like a piece, you know, mm -hmm. my dungeons might be a tower like we had last week. Right. Or something else, but it's more like it's an enclosed space, a dungeon being an enclosed space where the players only have left, right, you know, so many directions they can go. They can't, right. they can't do too much to surprise you except throwing chests of treasure out a window so the fireball traps go off. That was pretty smooth. That was a great <laughs> idea, Jeff. That was, a, that was so we cool. We know yeah. you're not. We know you're not, Jeffrey, but it was cool. It was a good idea. Uh, the Mega Dungeon being a subset of the dungeon is a super large, it's a large complex. Now, I remember early on, Dungeons being described, and this might be back me, it might be might be AD and D, pre-AD and D. They talked about the first level of your dungeon, the second level of your dungeon, and that the monsters should get tougher over each level. So if you had like, if you're planning to play levels one to ten, let's just say one to ten, and you make a dungeon that's got ten levels, you know, or you might. And so they go to fight all these things. There might be 14 levels, who knows? So, and I remember even you guys saying. You know, I would have a trap that would deposit you and you guys would go, how many levels down are we? And I'd let your dwarf have a roll and figure out, you go, oh my God, we're in the fourth level. We're only first level. We got to get back upstairs. This is too dangerous. You know, we would use the, I remember the, that. the, numeric, the numeric number as like, which was fine because you were right. That's how I did it. I did it by the book. The lower you went, the deadlier it got. I think there's an old video game. Can't remember what game system. It's been a long time. Uh, I think it was called Wizardry. Mm-hmm where you always you could find yourself in a level you couldn't handle and you would practically instantly die <laughs> i believe that you find yourself on level 72 you are second level <laughs> these gold get coins back? attack you and kill you because it had <laughs> right. it had uh gold coins that could do that <laughs> They're level 72 gold coins, right? Which you were not ready for. You could not spend those. You, weren't ready you to are spend instantly those. killed. So, so mega like dungeons like Under Mountain, um, what else? For Panathoke. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't say what else is a good mega dungeon. Would you would you classify this is interesting? I heard this on Tankar and a few others. Would you classify Temple of Elemental Evil as a mega dungeon? It's pretty close. It is pretty close. I mean, when you're used to stuff like um under mountain mm -hmm. uh that you got all the scale stuff what well the scale of under mountain oh uh it's not not really comparable but before mm -hmm. under mountain came out sure that mm -hmm. perhaps uh what was it called dragon mountain might even be yeah. it was pretty extensive yeah second edition rapana folk is definitely one yeah I think there's one called the Light, the Lost Minds of Arrakis, which is kind of an old school one that they've made, OSR one. And I'm sure there's others we're forgetting right now. There's um, another one that came out maybe either a year or two before or a year or two after Dungeon Mountain called A Night Below. Mm. But it had the same kind of expansiveness as uh, Dragon Mountain. Yeah, and, and they're meant to be full campaigns. I mean, yeah, and I think... I can't imagine, I guess as an old, I can't imagine, I would not enjoy, let's go into Undermountain and just stay there and try to do it all. I'm not even sure you could do it all. Make well, a dungeon. 
spoiler alert for Rapanathuk, you go deep enough in there, you find a city. Mm. And so once you find it, you could potentially, even if you ran into it early accidentally somehow, mm. you could you could make it a base and not have to technically leave the dungeon because oh. it's part of it. Oh, I don't true. know that Undermountain has anything like that. I don't know that one very well. I know it exists. Yeah. I know the 5e version is Dungeon of the Mad Mage, mm -hmm. which is just these, and I, I really, that's one of the 5e books, I think 5e book that is really well designed because they're like this level, they give you 20 levels. I think it's 20 different levels of Dungeon of the Mad Mage. They're not all for first to 20th level characters, but pretty close. They tend to rise. I think they do have a 20th level one. Hmm. And it's a pretty cool little book because it's like eight pages of a dungeon and the dungeons are not huge. But they're part, and you could literally place them anywhere you wanted in Undermountain. Ah, so I think as a product, whether you like 5e or not, that's a cool way to design a product. Because if Undermountain being, I mean, I had Undermountain one, I never got Undermountain two, but I remember Undermountain one. Remember, there was like, I think there was two poster size maps. When I showed it to you guys, you were like, holy crap, that's a huge dungeon. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and that's not all of it. You know, <laughs> there's right. secret levels and there's this and that. And I'm like, whoa. And I was, um, when I look at the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, I go, this is a better way to do it because they go, this is this level is probably best run for fifth to sixth level characters. And here it is, 15 rooms, and you can place it wherever you want in the mountain. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that could be, I could see a campaign like that because they're pretty, and they're pretty distinct and interesting. One's kind of got a slime theme and an ooze, slime, ooze theme. One's got some, oh, spoilers. One's got some other like drow displacer beast themes and it's kind of cool and and they're definitely portable you could rip one out and run an adventure you know the next night and just file off the serial numbers and so i just had know. a thought yeah we were talking about x crawl earlier mm -hmm. imagine doing a, a mega dungeon in x crawl Ooh. i mean but it would be the way it would be run would be a telethon nice it would be a a take on Jerry's kids on the Jerry Lewis telephone. <laughs> yeah. Because normally it's show. short because it, you're yeah. supposed to go in and out. But imagine a telethon uh, type or run crawl. I think that would be and cool. A, and imagine, so you have these, so you get these famous X crawl teams and they come in and tag each other in. They're right. doing it for charity. So they come in and, uh, you know, the first team, the Dungeon Gangsters go, they come out and they become the MCs and the next team goes in and picks up where they left off. Well, if you remember the telethons, you have uh, some ongoing things throughout the telethon, uh, especially later on. Right. So you could have that. You could uh, you could have the one group that's going to do the whole thing. Right. Top to bottom. Or oh, you could, yeah. Or as far as they can get before they die. Yeah. You know, for the kids. Yeah, for the kids. <laughs> um, Come die for the kids. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, I think that would be funny. You could really, you could really spin that. You just want to die in some random crawl? No, you don't. Come to Jerry's telethon, telecrawl, and die for the kids. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that would be hilarious. Yeah, dude, that is, dude, that's. I wrote that down. That is too good, Joseph. Good, good idea. Okay, mm -hmm. so mega dungeon. You, you know, you on a scale of one to five, you gave dungeon a seven or eight. How do you give a mega dungeon? If I were to say, Joe. We're going to play Rapanathook. Are you down? I own it, so yes. Right. <laughs> oh, yes. I want to go to 1B on level 7, please. <laughs> or we get to that one place where if you go in there, you're really not going to ever come out. <laughs> There's a few of them. <laughs> There's a couple of rooms that are death traps. Oh, like man. I, it would be... You'd, you're, you'd be lucky. Yeah. There's two of them <laughs> I can think of. Here's a question. As a style, would you like the Mega Dungeon be... What if I... Because this is how I used to do it. I don't usually tell you like, I'm running this adventure, I'm running that adventure. But what if I said um, this campaign, no, we'll just play campaign, and I just use for Panathu. And so periodically you guys would have to go there for different missions. You know, what if there was these devices, these objects you needed to get a hold of, and they said they were ancient, and they were only in Rapanathu. And so you'd catch one, and then your guy who sent you on the mission would say, okay, that's good. Now we got to go further along and you do something else. So you go do something else for a while and come back and say, I'm ready for piece two. Please go under Panathu. That could be kind of a cool way to use it. Sure. And I think the folks, at least on Eric's Tinkar's podcast, they call it 
Rappanathic, which might be the correct pronunci pronunciation. I but hope I think, not. I think Rapanathuk sounds better. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just think it does. But oh well. Yeah, I like Mega Dungeons. And I tell you what, um, generally speaking, I get really tempted to buy them. Every time I see a new Mega Dungeon, I'm like, like Barrel Maze. That's the one I was thinking of, Barrel Maze. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want that. Of course, I can't get it now because it's ridiculously expensive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For me, a Mega Dungeon is the five because I just see tons of ideas I can steal from. No, oh, I admit it's expensive now. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. Those that can call, I don't think you can get a hard copy of Barrel Maze on eBay for under 200 bucks. Oh, that's not worth it. No, no, no. Not for me. It's not. not it might be. Not unless you could just burn $200. Yeah, not for me. Okay. Another kind of crawl. Hex. Crawl. Hex crawl. An yeah. open ended sandbox style adventure that originated in old school DD games. In Hex Crawl, the GM produces a map of interesting points of interest for the players to explore with a fairly large geographical area. The map is given to the players. And bye bye, baby. Um, bye, Jen. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Where was I at? The uh, large geographical area. The map, the map is, given is given to the, to the players, player. usually as an in-character item. They usually have a reason for exploring the area, but the, it's not clear how to achieve their objective without exploring the map first. Uh, the map is divided into hexagons, hence the name. Right. It's really, from what I gather, just a an explore the wilderness. I mean, I think like Pathfinder did one, did a Kingmaker. Where you kind of go out and explore an area. Oh, okay. I I heard about uh, Kingmaker, but I never played it. Yeah, I have it. It's um, one of our friends is actually running it in Five E, and they're doing that pretty soon. They're having a good time. I th what do you think if we're like we're going to really do a true hex crawl where you're out in the wilderness? Because I, I thought I was going to do that with Savage Worlds, but it hasn't turned out to be that. I think I've gone down a classic path that I tend to do, but there is there's room for that. Because I have sure. a whole continent we've yet to explore that has yet to be tamed. I mean, Sanctuary only tames that little tiny piece of the coast. Once you get past that, you know, it's wide open. So it could become a hex crawl. Sure. And I think the um, West Marches style, which we may have talked about here before, where that's meant more, um, who's the guy's name? I can't remember his name. The guy that created that, you know, coined the guy West, the, the type, this word West marches. I can't talk tonight. He, uh, the idea was the adventurers where they, their base of operations is not that important. They come back and there's a map. So a handful of people go out and explore some of the wilderness. They come back and report on what they found. And then the next week or whenever the next group of people go do it. And it may not be the same five people. And the way he did it, this Robbins, this guy named Robbins, and the way he did it, the players were like, the ones that were supposed to have the impetus to go explore not the dm you don't tell them you don't tell the players the adventure they tell you where you're going where, right where they're going right so yeah in the hex crawl just about everything you encounter i believe is is randomly generated or well i don't know or, or the or the dm knows what's in the hex that they go to and Correct. then once they decide to go to that hex then that's what whatever he has planned for that hex happens yeah so yeah but from uh, i've never played in a hex crawl i've just heard about it so right me neither it sounds cool mm -hmm. but it sounds like um i wonder if a hex crawl especially going to true wilderness i think it would lean into the idea of domains that, that your players would eventually get powerful enough and go hey i conquered this part of the land i think i should this is my kingdom right it would make sense i mean if you get to seventh eighth ninth level and you cleared all this out no one else could claim the land before because there were giants in it you'd be like this is my place right i'm the lord of this land you know now if there was some great king who could bring an army down on your head you might have say hey i'd like to be a i'll be your vassal but i want this land okay build your keep there you have my permission and it's now yours you're the ruler of that region pay this percentage tax every year and do whatever you want unless you're like hey i'm tough enough to kill you so <laughs> I don't know. Right. It could work out that way. It all depends on what dynamics you want to set up. That seems to be a popular style in the OSR. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Big John is doing a hex crawl in his smoke and snow game. He is. 
I mean, I hope he calls in and gives us his ideas on it. Um, I think prep for that sounds scarier than it actually would be. I think as a DM, I would take something Professor Dungeon Master, I have a link there down below on one of his uh, podcasts on the sandbox, which we'll get to shortly. And I would definitely have players every time a session ended, it's okay. You guys had these different, and this is what you saw when the, when the adventure ended last time. What direction are you guys heading next time? You know, which 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 place are you going on the map so I can have it ready? Yeah, this overlaps a bit with with uh, sandbox. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. fairly similar. I think hex crawl has. I think hex crawl leans into the exploration phase in wilderness. Mm -hmm. I don't think your hex crawl would necessarily. I think mostly when they use that word, they picture going into the the dark jungles or into the dreaded forest or the unknown land beyond the mountain right stuff like that. yeah right but uh with a sandbox you're kind of doing similar thing where you're just saying where do you go this is what you see before you where do you go yeah we'll talk about sandbox thing. in a minute yeah. but you're, you're right i think there's a little more to sandbox too but i that's an interesting yeah. one i want to talk a lot about sandbox um then there's a point crawl now, a point crawl is a DM tool for handling overland travel in D&D. Interesting, overland travel is still hex-like. Much like a dungeon, though, where you build it from, as rooms and hallways, you're built from meaningful connections, so along roads, along rivers. And um, you kind of build it like a dungeon, so you have your points of interest. Now, I would imagine here, so a, um, a dungeon master would have his cool locations. Here is the Temple of Ling, and over here is you know, the lost caverns of Sojanth. And down here is the boiling, um, the boiling volcano of doom or whatever, you know, and these places would be connected. And the players, I think, I think the idea from what I've gathered is the players have from, from, say you're coming from the boiling caverns of doom, your only two exits, the only two paths are to two other the locations I named before the temple of Lang and then something else. So, I think the to me they feel like they work very tightly together. That you could make, you could have these points of interest within hex crawls, right? But I you, guess you could have a hex crawl. You go to the hex and it becomes a point crawl within the hex. Yes, to me it seems like it you says could. the characters. You could. Ahead, you could. I mean, you could have anything in the hex. So. Yeah. It says it says that since they're built like dungeons, we can use good dungeon design characteristics. Um, the um, I, I uh, have a link to Sly Flourish's comment on point crawls, and he links to the Alexandrians checking the dungeon to make our point crawls interesting and give players meaningful options while traveling. These characteristics include multiple paths, loop back shortcuts, and secret paths. Point cra crawls offer a flexible structure for overland wilderness and city-based adventures. I feel like a point crawl is almost just like a flow chart. Yeah. Strikes me right. like a flow chart. Right, and the map... There's a map at the end of the uh, of this uh, of the second uh, link that you Hill, have here. Bill Canton's link, yeah. Yeah, the, Hex crawl versus it's, point crawl. Yeah, it's a fanciful flowchart. Yeah, and I think you 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 bridge the point. Is there really a difference between a hex and point crawl? I think maybe only in technicalities, but I right. think you could use a point crawl as a. I mean, you could have like these big locations on your map. That you're like, hey, this, these are going to be cool places that I'm going to fully flesh out. And then I may do some randomness in between. And maybe the players will get caught up in some machinations of a goblin tribe or something else mm -hmm. along the way. And they can fully explore the hex. Um, to me, and I would love people to call in and let us know or send us emails. I don't see a huge difference other than the point crawl maybe being the flow chart that would lay over the hex crawl on the paper, literally. Well, with a with a hex crawl, once you get into a hex, yes. uh, a point crawl is one thing you can do within mm -hmm. it. It doesn't. Right. I mean, there's no there's no particular thing that you have to do once you say, "Hey, we want to go to hex eleven twenty five. Right. We're in uh, we're in the uh, southern most uh, uh, edge oh, of that hex, and we we go in. What happens? What right. what do we see? And that, the DM can then just say whatever he has planned, or uh, there's the random charts that uh, people suggest using as well. So um, yeah. some of that he might have done uh, in advance. Some of he might was he might just be doing it all on the fly right there at the table. 
I think if I were to do this style, and I kind of have before in my life, I would have a point crawl as being locations that I had already figured out. And then I would probably use random tables for when the players, you know, start because they wouldn't have to be the points wouldn't have to all be within a hex. I mean, they could be, but they could right. also be between hexes. And so I could have the Temple of Lung could Ling could be, you know, 500 miles from the, you know, caverns of bubbly doom. So, sure. I mean, sure. And then yeah. you, like you're saying, you could have a point crawl overlay a hex. A hex yeah, to me, that feels like overlay it. a, not a necessarily a hex. It could overlay your entire crawl. Crawl. So it could be a multiple hexes. These are the big site based, story based places that I created and found juicy, but the players may get involved in something in one of the hexes that end up being much better. Could be the whole focus of the campaign. Who knows? Right. But I think, I think you could use a point crawl without the hex part. Sure. Yeah. And you could probably use a hex without the point crawl. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're you could just say, hey, we're exploring and I'm rolling crap random and I got a, my orcs are over here. This is a jungle over here. Wait till they get there and go, let me roll. Oh, look, there's King of the Lich King. Let's go check it right, out. Right. And you um, can mix it. You can mix and match too a little bit, I think, because you can oh, have a sure. hex crawl in which uh, I think the way some people play it is nobody knows anything about it. It's frontier, so to speak. But what you could have is that plus somebody has a map. You're not sure if it's accurate or not. And maybe there's parts of it that are burned or parts of it that have worn in time, worn, mm -hmm. worn off in time. And you have points that uh, this uh, mountain range and maybe some sort of notation for it and yes. to various notations on the map and maybe only some of them and don't know how much of them are accurate and we're going to go figure it out so you do have points but you yep. also have your hex crawl that you're so you could probably right. mix this a little bit and muddy the waters a lot which is great yeah the, oh yeah at, at the end i have a, i just added a question i think it's gonna be fun for us to discuss at the end um so um then i heard this idea of an urban crawl and I went to Alexand the Alexandria, and he's talked about it in the past, and he talked about it recently, and he basically said he's not sure he's got a handle on it. To me, and he said he didn't think it was, I said, there's no clear definition I found online for an urban crawl. Mm -hmm. I, but however, it seemed to me to have the crawl structure. Like right? a point crawl? Yeah. yeah. And set solely in a city, like Avalon by uh, Brett B at Gaming and BS, which I do have the PDF of that. Sounds mm -hmm. kind of cool, actually. Or Tolis. By Monty Cook. That's a massive book, a huge tome, and there's a 5e e version of it now. Um, but where you set your whole, if not your whole campaign, at least a whole adventure within the city, and maybe you point use points within the city of interest that the players would go to. Yes. Or like Sigil. Oh, dude, I, I think Sigil. Sigil. Oh, man. This would be, problem. I think uh, a crawl would be a great way to explore Sigil. <laughs> oh, Sigil. Yeah, you would just be really. Yeah, there's so much stuff that that city is so full of so crap. full of <laughs> crap too. Bad news. You gotta, yeah, you gotta be careful. I think a uh, a canny adventurer will not trust anybody rattling their bone box. Right. So, <laughs> uh, I listened to uh, Ten Cars' latest, which you, uh, which is about? this is the uh, where you've uh, you're riffing off of it for this episode yes. for this okay, episode, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, neither. I don't think neither he nor, nor Joe, Joe Warrior. They don't like uh, they don't like Sigil at all. I think Joe likes the idea of it. Yeah, and I think Eric does too. I just don't think they know what to do with it. And I, I wanted to call in and say, dudes, you can do so much with Sigil. But you know, people say that about a lot of stuff. They would say, Randy, Fate is the greatest game ever. You can do so much in the Dresden universe. I guess it depends. And and it's just something. I wonder if oh you OSR people out there. I would love to know if you've ever fully explored the Planescape setting. It's only one interpretation of how the planes work. Right. Um, but as I like city, the overall setting. No, me too. Sigil isn't my favorite. As someone who likes to play heroic characters and fight the bad guys, Sigil is difficult to deal with because it's full of bad guys and it's yeah, pretty much. A lot of, yeah, a lot of, yeah, I mean, I, I think. It's a whole plane of scum and villainy. <laughs> yeah it kind of is it's not people and some folks say well i'm not evil i'm just not your brand of good 
because yeah. and, that's well, the postmodern. Well, right, it's right. philosophy. It's philosophy. Yeah, right. right. Philosophy. I agree with you. I mean, but I think it's a great place to be. A but hero people will. But I'm not. I'm saying that you're saying that's what people will say. I agree with you. People, people meaning will people say that. Sickle. Yes. In Sigel. Yes. yes. People in Sigel will <laughs> say that. Poop. Right. But it's poop. Yes. Yes. Joe doesn't like. That. Well, that last time we played, dude, you and Debbie were like, I had this benefactor for these guys in Sigel. And they were just like, it was like two adventures. You did these two things for him. And you're like, I hate this dude. We're not doing it. Screw you. You right. and Debbie both were like, I hate this guy. And he was kind of doing some shady stuff. And you guys were like, I think you, you wouldn't describe yourself as lawful good, but you and Debbie both generally play lawful good. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. If we had to give you an alignment. You and my wife pretty simpatico you don't put up with any bull crap as far as the bad as any kind of shady crap you're not no prevarication that. you start no, talking and, wiggle words i'm out <laughs> exactly and that's wiggle, weasel words weasel words but exactly and i think that's great i think mm -hmm. especially if you're powerful because unfortunately in sigil if you're weak and if you come off as weak you can get yourself in trouble quick sure and it's you all pop about off your mouth you're a dead man and it's who's rubbing whose shoulders. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some factions that aren't inclined to hurt you. Right. Or they wouldn't physically accost you unless you were really in their way. Right. You know, and they, you'd have to really be in their way. And that would be rare. But the factions are a little bit, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a like tough Like the Dustmen, they pretty yep. much wouldn't bother you unless you were opposing them, probably. Yeah, unless you were trying to raise dead and they hate the undead and you were all. But if you're just like doing your thing mm -hmm. and you're like, hey, we're adventuring, we're causing trouble. And they're like, that's cool, because soon you're going to be joining us. Yeah. Dustmen yeah. are about collecting dead bodies. And they'll be like, hey, can I give you like a uh, tin silver for your body when you die? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's all they'll pay. They won't pay much. No. Because they're just going to take you and bury you and make sure you right. can't come back as an undead. Right. But, um, but yeah, you're right. There's some, then there's others which are claimed to be super, and they're super lawful. The harmonium, but they are like whoo hoo. Depends on which they one range. Need. They range neutral, lawful neutral, lawful good. Some are like this particular flavor of lawful neutral and yeah. really hard asses. And yeah, you're right. But I, th I think we're getting off the path a little bit. But Planescape is definitely a cool, a challenging setting for people that want to be heroic. It's, it's challenging, but it gives the planes flavor. It, it absolutely does. Beyond Sigil, the planes, the all the different supplements for the planes, the blood war, all that stuff is really cool. Yeah. It is really cool. And Sigil itself, at least it's a place where if that you're could be a point level, crawl. That whole thing could be a point crawl. Absolutely. Sure. Especially with uh, the way doors work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The doors could be the points. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like you could, and what you could do is, I mean, which I've never, which i'm getting off into planescape we better just move on because i was like yeah, yeah, i'm so yeah. excited about it. let's move on to something else so yeah. urban crawl so the idea of a city do you think these crawl types point hex urban dungeon whatever uh or any of them i don't think any of them are more or less more complicated for a dm to run than others i don't think so you I basically you it's a flow chart like you're saying even a hex map is a simplistic flow yep. chart but still a flow mm -hmm. chart you have to go you have to go through this hex to get to the next one because you, you have to have something bypass. for the players to do. I, like As me, I would just, you know, you couldn't let, to me, a hex crawl, the only thing about a hex crawl would be intimidating is me expecting to show up at the table and the players go, okay, we're going this way. And oh, I have no inkling of what, what that what's there. But this can, the only thing that's a down, and I've, I've read this before and I kind of liked it at first, but the more I think about it, I don't. But these kinds of crawls could uh, encourage the quantum ogre yes which i don't really care for you know i, I understand used to be, it but yeah. uh no matter where you go you're going to meet the ogre right that's the idea you come in fork in the road the dm is planned for the ogre to attack you on the right fork you go to the left fork he's like oh that's the only encounter i had so the ogre's there yeah um i don't think it's something that would be easily parsed out by players that you did that but there's something something cheesy about it yeah you know and you're there's you're lazy leaving. dungeon master stuff sly flourish but yeah i don't think he ever really talks about that no i don't think he's a he's not a quantum ogre guy no do i think it's horrifically bad no no it's just I think lazy it's cheesy and you're it's lazy and not in a good way right. it's like oh i just i want to have these encounters happen so they're going to happen um which you might as well just tell them go right so you can fight my do my thing mm -hmm. it's really a railroad but deceptive. Okay, getting away from crawls then, then there's this idea of, 
and these I didn't find full definitions of, but I kind of pieced some words together I found online. So I don't, that's why I don't have links. Character driven, a game that is focused on studying the characters that make up your party of adventurers. Now this doesn't have to be Joe, where you're studying your psychology, but it does mean that if you're a bard who is hoping to get into the bard at college, and that is your plan for your character, I make paths for you to have a chance to achieve that. Right, right. I get that. And the adventures and the things we do could be centered about you trying to do that. And maybe someone else wants to be wants to be influential in the city. So they figure if they can help you to start them, they can become someone who is known as a, a friend to popular and popular and well-liked people. Someone else, you know, so everybody. And if they have, you know, their characters, if their characters goals are about, you know, hey, I have been my, you know, mom and dad was killed by orcs, uh, my family, and I want to, and I have this uh, incredible fear of orcs, and I want to overcome this, and so I'm going to hang on to these dudes and adventure to where I can eventually fight orcs and destroy them. And my plan right. is eventually to kill all the orcs, you know, orcicide. Um, Not a bad plan. It's not, I think that's not a bad plan. For others, it might be a different sort of idea, but I think as a DM, you just wait. You'd have to wait till you see your characters. Well, I, see, the thing is, there's also, there's a give and take with having a character-driven game. Yeah. So from my point of view, uh, as, a, as a player, I need a little bit of meat from the mm -hmm. campaign. Yeah. Even if it's a little bit. If I know what the campaign is going to be like it's easier to come up with uh character goals sure as a damage so look i'm going to set this campaign um you're going to be in the city of Waterdeep, and you're going to be children all of you guys all your families are either merchants who ply the seas or your ship captain's family you're all well to do go oh yes yeah. so i'm going to make a bard Yep. Who's going to subvert the Lords of Waterdeep? There you go. You're so He's you're going yeah. to supplant the Lords of Waterdeep with the merchant right. class. Correct. There you go. That's your plan. So you're you're into your family's name and making things happen, but you're going to be sneaky boy about it. Sure, yeah. sounds good. And so, and then then the next guy says, "I want to do this and I want to do that," and we start to explore that. And you know, as you play, whether you have a nine-page background in your character or just that statement, that's enough. And eventually, your character might be such that you know, I don't know what. Even though your dude is kind of sneaky, it turns out just because of the way you joke, he never lies. He makes deals with people. He goes, if I do this, I promise you I'll do this. If you do this, right. I promise you I'll do this. But I hate the Lords of Waterdeep's why? Because maybe maybe your family's lost four or five notches in rank. You don't get the best goods and service deals so that your your ship is, you know, your, your company is kind of like, you look down upon by the other merchant companies. You know, it's the so-and-so company. We hate them. Yeah, so I think you'd build a campaign around that and other people would have different goals. I think it's, it could be, if it's character driven, I think you would have to, I would feel obligated to like, it would feel like to me one session at least, if not an adventure, would be getting your goals and purposes um, See, that's, started, yeah. started, not completed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one leg of yours, then the next one would be doing Debs, the next one would be doing Patrick's, and the next one would be doing Joyce's, and then we'd go that way, you know, we'd have to let everybody that would be. Follow. I could, I could see why. Now, some people like might like running that, mm -hmm. but I think it would. If you're going to do that, it's better if the players all come up with a common goal that the DM can work with instead Correct. of having to laboriously work in everybody's because uh, right. that can be a pain, especially if you have a player that doesn't necessarily think of one. Right, because I just, I don't know, because, and some players would be fair, like, dude, I don't, I've got a buddy Greg, our buddy Greg D, he's like, he's like, I don't really know who my fighter is until, until I'm rolling dice. Right, and you sometimes know? you don't know them until three or four sessions in. Yeah. It's, heard, it can uh, be hard. Glenn said that, yeah, and it's okay, actually, sometimes the best characters come out of what you see at the table, mm -hmm. and so I think a session zero would be needed. I would be leery of having lots of players in a game like that. Mm -hmm. I'd probably limit it to four. And I would like you all to be part of that merchant class so you would all know each other. Um, everybody would have, and, and if two characters are going to be at somewhat cross purposes, I'd want them both to, I'd want to say it out loud. 
you guys are both cool with this. And the goal is not to screw the game up, but you might do some stuff that causes Joe a little bit of issue. A little friction. He might, he might do some stuff that causes your family a little. Maybe your family was the one that called them out on something. Mm -hmm. So Joe's like, yeah, I'm your friend. You're like, I hate that dude. Right. He's annoying. He's a so-and-so, you know, because he's part of this family. And, and of course it could change over time. Yeah, I think, I think, and that would be kind of fun because then you're giving the players what they want. Now, I don't think it has to be all, I, I'd be leery to do that all the time. Because things have to happen that aren't, because even in our regular life, I mean, my life is to become emperor of the world, but I'm not always working on that goal. That's part time. Right. <laughs> and though the world really, really, really cares about your goal. It does. It really. has other things to do. It does. I mean, it really wants to make sure that I'm emperor, but I mean, at this point, yeah, no. Um, now, here's one that I, I'm near and dear to my heart. Uh, plot, oh, well, with character driven, I think, I think. I don't think it lends itself to drop in, drop out very easily. Not really. I think it's, I think it is harder to prepare as a DM. Oh, because the, DM, because just, the players yeah, are yeah. giving you some guidelines and you got to make sure that it follows through though. Though I think good DMs can do it. I mean, I think even regular beginning DMs can do it. So you got to put some time into it. I do. Maybe just me. I would have to. What about you, plot? The Go thing ahead. is with some of the other stuff we, came, we talked about. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can use stuff off the shelf. You can randomly generate things with character driven stuff. You really have to take the reins on that. You can still use prepared stuff. Yep. But you do, you have, you, there are things you must prep or you're not getting to the, the character driven stuff. But why are these dudes going into Undermount? I got the Undermount module. But why are they going to Undermount if they're these young little sea princes dudes? Yeah. you know <laughs> and princesses whatever yeah that seems weird now plot driven I, I broke this into two and i don't know why i did i'm going to link these two together homebrew and plot homebrew dm plotted and plot driven so plot driven is a game that is focused on a structure right mm -hmm. the dm could design or you could buy it uh you kind of want the players to stay within the limit the lines a little bit uh, if it's going to be plot if i say look we're going to play rise of the rune lords right i, I think it and i'm not saying it's right but I think it tends to be, we need to make characters that would be in Varicia and would be in the town of Sandpoint for a reason, you know, and probably pretty well connected because you want to be motivated to like help the town out or you could be either a good guy or from here. Um, characters, are, I think characters are mostly expected to be made to fit the story. We're going to play X crawl. So don't play, you don't want to play a wizard who doesn't like to go on X, doesn't like to do X crawls at all. I'm not right. part of an X, unless the player, unless you're okay with that, but that'd be kind of weird. I'm not a, I'm not a dungeon league guy. I'm off, I'm off, I'm a, I'm a, an agent. <laughs> I was like, I guess that could work, but you know, <laughs> that'd be kind of weird. I mean, you expect players to build, you know, the lone wolves cause a lot of trouble in the plot, in the plot driven games. Right. Because if you're going to, um, if everybody's going to be X crawlers, but you, uh, you might, maybe you're a plant and you're going to go in there to subvert or disrupt yeah. the crawls, but yeah. you, that, that has limited play. Yes. And that so has many to be. disruptions. You're going to be out on your butt or dead. And I feel like, and I feel like you need to that's something I don't want to keep secret. Right. Tell the group, look, I'm going to cause you guys a little headache and maybe you're going to help me see the air in my ways. You know, I'm looking for a situation where you help me. And my character will remember that. And eventually I'm going to come clean. And you right. guys can give me some crap, maybe kick me out for a crawl. We can have that part of the outside story plot, you know. And then eventually let me let me be part of the team again. Or that character convinces the rest of the party to join him in his down with the crawls thing. Oh, and, yeah. And that, dude, becomes, and, and that becomes the campaign. Campaign. To destroy the X crawl domination of the world yeah right, which would right, be right. quite that would be quite quite a challenge because you know oh, emperor, yeah. ronnie, emperor ronnie would not be down with that i fought the law and the law won <laughs> yeah so in a game like that i just had an idea so in a game like that it is dangerous that it can become a railroad and the worst plot driven game i've ever heard of and eric tinker i think and him and joe the lawyer talked about it was those old dragonlance modules from first or second edition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I tried to mimic 
the novels, those were horrible. Do you hear him talking about how one of them, I, mean, I remember this too, Gold Moon has to live through this. And and even if you kill Feud, Feud Master Toad, whatever his name was, he still lives. I'm like, that's stupid. That is 10 times stupid. Yeah. I don't yeah. know uh, what possessed them to do those modules. It'd be one thing if you had a plot line parallel to the Dragonlance saga and you saw glimpses of it from your gameplay. Mm -hmm. That would be one thing. And then, right. then you wouldn't have to worry about all that other nonsense. But yeah, if you're going to, uh, you might as well just have an animated feature that, well, that sucked. So maybe we don't do that. Right. <laughs> Dragonlance cartoon was really not good. It was so, bad. So it should uh, it could have been good. It should have been good. Should have been. But it just it wasn't. wasn't. It was. But uh, yeah, maybe they shouldn't even made any modules. It was dumb. It was dumb. Uh, in that world, but not uh, beholden to that plot. Yeah, and there were some, I know in third edition, there was an, a Dragonlance big thick adventure book and our buddy Tim ran it for some of our other friends. And it's it was fine, but it wasn't about War of the Land stuff. Right. Don't try to, I think that's a bad move. To right. try to, because they were trying to tell the novels, you know, they did the, they went to the dungeon of Zach Saroth. You know, I'm like, dude, you let players get in there. Things going to get weird. Yeah. <laughs> now, how about this? So the idea of a sandbox, and I didn't give this as a, a broad title, but the sandbox is the idea that the players drive where the game goes in some way, shape or form. Right. You just give them a, you just give them a toy box. You just give them the sandbox. It's kind of like a hex crawl, but not really. Here's, here's the features. It's a town. Maybe, maybe it's, some people say a sandbox, like the world a can town. be a sandbox. Huh? The world can be a sandbox. The world can be a sandbox. Where are you? Here's some names. Where are you guys going? We're going here. Are you interested in that? Yeah, sure. We're going to go talk to the farmer. The farmer says, you know, oh, man, my cows are dying one every week. Well, we want to check that out. I don't care. They go somewhere else. You know, um, one driven by characters where they have no objective, no goals, merely placed in a world and told to make their own fun. Mm. That's kind of what they say a sandbox is. And I know you've you've read some stuff where stable sandbox ideas were wacky. I, I probably have. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but yeah. oh, I wish I could because you told me. But I tell you that idea, just the statement uh, game is one in which the players are given no objectives or goals, which is sandboxing, but are merely placed in a game world and told to make their own fun. Wow. Well, at the, we, we do the that worst. at the table anyway. Huh? We kind of do that at the table anyway. We sandbox. We make our own, yeah. I'm not, I'm talking about in the general sense. When you sit right. down to play, you make your own fun. Right. So um, I see all of these crawls mm -hmm. as special cases of sandboxing. You're coming to my right. final question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So even if it's GM managed or character driven, either way, you're yeah. given a toolbox uh, with, if it's purely uh, character driven, they get to, they choose the features. You don't give them a whole lot to go on. They just make stuff up or whatever or the gm gives you bits and pieces that you grab onto or don't or not i mean so either way what do you think of this so you start at the end of the welcome winch that's the name of the tavern what does it look like joe who's there sally right so oh, I, see, I see a mysterious man beckoning us forward and then i gotta play off that right right so it can be very improv -y. Mm -hmm. which Could is be. good for some people and not good for mm -hmm. others. Um, mm -hmm. And then it can be some, uh, sometimey good. Like uh, tonight I'm fine with improv, but tomorrow I'm tired and I just want to roll dice. So right. improv is a mixed bag and it's good. It's a, it's a tool, but I think some people do uh, rely way too heavily on it or yeah, think, that's just yeah. their style, which is fine. But yeah. uh, I, I think, think it's more style. of a tool instead of the tool. And then you know, player, player style where you're not terribly into narrative. You're like, dude, just, I want to follow whatever's going on, whatever he's going to do. I'm here to roll dice and kill stuff. My character will talk in character border, but I'm not going to like, I can't create stuff. I'm not down. I mean, we, I've had a player, well, Greg D, the aforementioned, his wife played. She don't, she don't respond well to putting her on the spot. Right. You know, and I said, sometimes you're tired. You don't want to be on the spot. I think you got to let the player say pass. I don't know. Right. And, and it ain't going to be a butthole about it either side. The DM right. doesn't be a butthole. If I don't know that, and Joe, I don't, Joe, I haven't noticed or not been perceptive, haven't read the table. Joe's been working 12 hour days, shows up on Saturdays, ready to roll some dice. Say, hey, Joe, 
you know, uh, there's the barkeep calls you over. Why does he do that? Oh, I don't know. You just called me there. You ain't got to be a butthole. You can say, Brandy, I'm not really feeling the narrative stuff. I'm like, okay. And I can look over at Debbie and say, why did he call Joe over there? Well, he noticed that Joe had this. I'm like, oh, really? So I can play like that, but not every single time. Right. And I don't think that's required. I think a sandbox can have some more GM input, which is the other part where you manage it a little bit where I, where it's not fully GM managed, but I say, okay, the, there is a mysterious stranger in the corner. He's smoking a pipe. And whenever he draws on the pipe, you see his eyes light up. Mm -hmm. you know, Oaks called him Strider. And then, you know, there's a group of dudes that are drinking and they seem to, one of you guys get a drink. Hey, join us, blah, blah, blah. And then there's, there's a pointy hat dude with a few friends that got a map out over by this, over by the fireplace and you know you can do all that sort of stuff right you know? I, I don't Let think the that players choose yeah i don't think sandbox you don't necessarily sandbox doesn't necessarily equate to improv right but it can it but can. You, it can so your sand, table. yeah sandbox can be randomly generated or the dm may just have things on the back burner until the the players go there right i've you got can those totally three prep things. you can totally prep like 50 million things and then you say well if they go there this is what happens so uh it all depends on the dm's style behind the scenes what they do how they prep and so, in the same yeah so improv i sandbox and improv i think mesh well but yes. i don't think that they are necessarily have tos right because you do have the group that could be like what if the group's rogue or thief is particularly persuasive and his character hates religions he hates the church of you know foltus that's in town so he's like hey guys there's church in foltus here right randy i'm like yeah he goes it's dark they're closed up let's go in there and steal the coffers let's let's, let's break in and maybe the rest of the group is like they're not particularly religious they don't really care they're not good guys they're kind of mercenary they're like all right and so my care my plans for the wizardy group and the stranger and the drinking guys they go out the window sure do. Head off to the temple and in a sandbox um i would say that's fair game and i do think professor dungeon master there in that little video youtube he talks about in each session in players i would be nice if they would tell you what their plan is right It'd be nice to know beforehand but that can be tough especially at session one right um, i think a lot of that stuff I think two or unless you've played a lot together already and maybe mm -hmm. you've done some planning ahead of time before you sit down and throw dice mm -hmm. but uh it might be a good idea just to play a few times have even just even if it is a little railroady yes to lay some groundwork yeah. so that not uh, so that the players know what's going on in the world and the dm knows what's going on with the players so after that you can Loosen branch up. out loosen up get sandboxy get improv -y, however you want to go but sometimes it's hard just to do that from the day one yeah i mean you can just say look you've been gathered together to do this thing say look guys this first adventure i'm just sending you guys your characters are going on you've agreed to do this and then during that adventure during play lay out different nuggets mm -hmm. after they complete the short scenario like professor dungeon master says say hey dudes that was cool. You got your reward. Anything you found interesting today that you would like to pursue? And they go, oh, I liked I liked how that uh, lady in the tower, we noticed a lady, we kept seeing her come to the tower. Whenever we'd come back into town, she'd be up there and she'd flash, she'd turn this candle on. She'd light the candle, turn it, light it back on, turn it off, light it, cover it, light it, cover it. It's like three times every time. I think she needs our help. We're like, yeah, we're going to go there next. Or she has OCD. Correct. Correct. Could, could be anything. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying it's a yeah, hook. Yeah, I know. I'm just making what, a joke. What sounds interesting to them. Um, and this is one that I think uh, Eric had mentioned he likes. And I, I get the draw to this, especially for some games like I'm running Deadlands next week. I think it lends itself well to episodic adventures. There's a style of episodic module of the week, module of the month. You simply mm -hmm. run a different adventure each time you play. Maybe with the same characters, maybe not. Let's say with the same characters. The concern, the connective tissue between them doesn't really matter. That's how we did old, uh, back in the day. We just ran modules. That's all that is, right? Yeah. We just, I mean, we just went through modules when we were younger. That's super easy for drop in, drop out. Oh, yeah. When you start a new adventure, two guys like, hey, I can't make it next week. Okay. Make them a new character this level. We're doing this module. We're doing, we're doing the Temple of Elemental Evil, or we're doing Hamlet. Then we're going to jump to Keep on the Borderlands, and we're going to jump to 
what was the one um little sea adventures i can't remember it salt marsh oh danger salt marsh. Dun danger at dunwater or whatever danger, yeah danger. danger will robinson yeah, i think those are definitely easy for the dm to prep you just prep the module or the adventure mm -hmm. and say, well, so we're doing this week next week could be completely different right um what do you what's your thought of that kind of style of play since we've done it a lot in the past and i think you've i think i have i think you've mentioned that that's not you're not terribly fond of it right well it's fine that module but... week all right it's okay it's fine um mm -hmm. it's it, just like a mega dungeon or just a dungeon mm -hmm. you know, it's just a module so yeah. um it all depends on the dm so mm -hmm. uh I don't really, as a player, I really don't care a whole lot on the what. Mm -hmm. It's the how more than anything else. So how the DM presents it mm -hmm. and how the players, including me, we all react to it and play and mesh together at the table. So right. whether the DM has a canned adventure that they've bought mm -hmm. or they've made up on their own or mm -hmm. we're doing a sandbox or uh, he's got a bunch of tables and we're hex crawling, totally random. Right. None of that matters to me as much as um, how how good the DM is at presenting mm -hmm. and running the game, and how good the the, ta the the crew at the table is in running through and uh, and meshing together to overcome the challenges and play and all that. So, so if uh, you have good play at the table, including all those things. Mm -hmm. An hour is okay. This week we're running Keeping the Borderlands because we're low level. You made it to third level. Very cool. We ran that. And maybe it's not this week. Maybe it's every, you know, you play every, you play five or six sessions till the adventure is done. Canned mm -hmm. adventure. Next, I'm going to run Return to Whatever. And like your characters, I'll say, okay. So the game was great. We had a good time. But then I say the time in between, a few months pass or a year passes. And you guys hear of this mysterious thing. The giants are gathering in the hills. You got to go check it out. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're going to do the steading of the hill giant chief or whatever. Sounds You'd be good. okay with it. That'd be fine. Yeah. You don't need that. Yeah. See, and this is, it comes from the privilege that I have of you running games. And mm -hmm. just because you're running against the giants doesn't mean it's the same way you've run it in the past or some oh, other no. people. You're, it's not going to be precisely that thing. It's going to be fun. Uh, me and my wife and a few other people that we play with a lot. Yeah. We'll have a good time. Yeah. So you can, I mean, uh, I can't think of a module that we've, that you've run that mm -hmm. I've played in that I, I wouldn't want to play in again. I don't think. No, I think I could absolutely, I think I could run Rise of the Rune Because it would be run differently anyway. It would be because I have a different, yeah, every time I run it, it's different. A slightly um, different take. Which there's another link to this is this idea of adventure paths. And the most people would think of Pathfinder and probably rightly so, mm -hmm. but I'm talking more about linked adventures. So you could even talk about the giant series, the G series or the D series with the drag. That's pretty much an adventure series. path. Yeah. And the rise of the rune lords and mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. like that. Um, I think Slave those are series. Cool. Yeah. The slaver series. I think, I think it would be cool to say, hey, we're going to run through these. So make a character that fits this starts out at eighth level, make an eighth level character. Here we go. Or as the Rune Lord start at first level, we're going to play it up probably about 15th. And I want to just run these six different adventures all the way through. Yeah. Um, and they could even all have their own little charm. If you ran the uh, against the Giants, I would that would be some good nostalgia. Sure. And uh, uh, and all that. So, yeah. So what about and, one? Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think those are easy for prep. And again, now I don't I think a linked adventure path would be I think they're fine for drop in, drop out, but they're less, less good than just ran a module. Now we got a new module, ran a module. Now we got a new module. Um, probably less great for drop in, drop out, but probably okay. Um, what one shot city? That's different fine. Characters every session, different adventures every time. Maybe one different shots are good. Yeah. This is where I will break what I've just said. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you're going, if we're going to do a one shot, and you say it's going to be against the Giants, I'm going to say why. why oh, not? Oh. So if it's, especially um, if it's going to be at a convention or at our Gen Con mm -hmm. or at our Cabin Con, why yeah, not do something a little more gonzo or weird or a yeah. uh, different game system or something right. like that? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, 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 an old school adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose as a one shot, if you did it as a uh, 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 interesting new take on it, uh, uh, turn it over on its ear or mm-hmm. something like that, that would be okay. Yeah, if I said like you're gonna play, we're gonna play, um, we're gonna play the giant series where you're gonna start out as prisoners of this giant chieftain, right? And you have to escape, and we're gonna play it all the way through. And your objective is not only escape, but then to get stuff to go back and get revenge. That's the story. We're not going beyond that. Right. You know, escape, get your gear, get some gear, and then get revenge. Right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, and I mentioned I, I put others. Did you think of any other styles of no? Game? I think I don't know because I, I think you ran you uh went through the full spectrum of games there that I can yeah. I think you did I think you nailed it, covered all the bases. Here's my final question that one I've been saving. We kind of got to it close, and you've mentioned it real close to it. I think it can't, I'm going to make a statement. I think a campaign can at one time or the other, a good long running campaign could be all these. Oh, sure. Sure. Could could have could be at different points in time, all these things. Right. Sure thing. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that's I honestly think that's a great way to run a campaign. Sure. Just mix it up. Okay, we're going to start with hex crawls. All right, your hex crawl, you find this, and then you find this dungeon. All right, now it becomes a dungeon crawl. Do that for a while. I'm like, my character really wants to build a keep. That's your goal. Well, guess what? You're amassing a lot of fortune. You build it. You guys get high level. You, you completed, you know, you've done several forays into a Panathuk. You guys are ninth, 10th level. And guess what? The giants are on the giants are on a war path. You're going to have to deal with the giants. Why? Because they're coming to your land. Oh, crap. You know? Right. So you could get all those things in there. Right. And then you could do a one shot in yep. that same thing as in you. And this is a, a call to uh, Big John is you one of your, your men uh, comes back from exploring and says, we found this weird metallic structure that's circular. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, so you can have a one shot spaceship in, uh, um, adventure. In you could even campaign. do different characters. Imagine you guys are ninth, tenth, twelfth level, and your rulers and leaders and stuff. And you're like, well, we got some retainers that are about seventh, eighth level. We're going to send them to go explore that weird disc place. And so you got a group of seventh level adventurers, your retainers and hire, trusted hirelings or trusted retainers. Let's call them retainers because they're there for you. And you go play them. Right, right. And they get to do that adventure and then report back to your characters. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else you? Think about with the styles and types of campaigns, or yeah. would any of these would you call would you call it a favorite? Or are you calling dungeons your favorite, or just you don't really care? You just want the game. If the game is good, the game is good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to say these are my favorite. I would say one shots are my least favorite. If I mean if that's all yeah. we were playing was one shots, that would be yeah. tough. I would say but, that. Um, I could do episodic even. That wouldn't bother me much. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. All right, all right so. We're moving on to like it, love it, or leave it. Yes. All right. So hopefully these don't overlap. I didn't double check. Let me um, let me just one minute. I got to pull mine up here. Am I going first this time? Because you did last time. Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. I don't. I don't. I don't have to. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah. We must maintain order in the universe. There must be order. Okay. Let me see here. I'm opening up some crap on my computer. This is not the one that I wanted. All right. Like it, love it, or leave it for Yosef. <clears throat> I haven't asked this, but you've mentioned it, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it. What do you think about collecting stuff? Well, that's what we do as players. Collect. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> In general. How are you t- I'm not a collector. Yeah. I'm, re- I'm not really. So you would say leave it, not interested. Um. Yeah. I mean, if I collect stuff, it's accidental. Right. Oh, I actually I have five of these. I didn't realize it, kind of thing. Right. What about your Munchkin? You had a Munchkin fetish for I, a while. Yeah, yeah, for a while. I liked yeah. it a lot. You've had. So you've had... I would say maybe I would say um, I've had some. Um, some collector collector streaks in the past, but at the moment, right. you're really not. 
Um, me, I think it's definitely I'm a collector. Um, what about reading? I like reading. You like reading? Reading's important. I think so. It's what they would call fundamental. Yeah, but I don't mean just like reading a sentence. I mean more like books. reading books. Oh, you yeah. read a lot of books. I don't read as much as I used to. I, I don't it. either. I need to get back into it. But yes, I like reading books. Um, uh, I've read, I think more recently, I've listened to more books than read mm. physical books. That's a different experience, isn't it? It is. Better or worse, I don't really know. I haven't, hmm. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, the jury's out on that one for me. You read the last two Dresden novels, haven't you? Yes. I haven't read them yet. So I need to read them. Yes, I'm behind. You do. Um, video games. Nah, leave them. <laughs> I feel the same way. They end up being a time sink, and I, I'll play for a while. I'm like, well, I just wasted a week of my time. <laughs> me too. Yeah, I feel the same way. All right, dude, that was quick. Yeah. Dogs or cats? Oh. You're on the spot. I am. Puppy dogs. There you go. Dogs for sure. I do like my cats. I've, they've grown on me since I married my wife 20 years ago. I mean, I was like, a, I, that would have been like, no question. I don't really like cats. I do like cats, but I love dogs. Love Good dogs. man. Yep. That is the correct answer. Yes. Is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> I'm going to say yes, especially if it's kosher. If it's Hebrew national hot dogs, not only is it a sandwich, it's real meat. It's uh, phenomenal. Yes, I think so. You don't think so? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I say because, it is. Because, uh, you know, I think it's 50-50 uh, on the internet. Right. So I don't know. Who knows? Right. <laughs> Uh, oh. beef, pork, chicken, or fish? Dude, choose choose one. You were making me hungry, and I just had a steak for dinner. Um, I can choose one. Just one. Pork. Pork is the most versatile meat in the universe. Pork for the win. All right. All right. I would go with beef, so you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was glad that I was wrong. All right. Excellent. That was fun times. I yes, yes, yes. All right. Playing in the mud. Mud yes, sword. Code word yes. mud sword. Yeah, mud sword. So this is um currently a not very good code name for me trying to me and Joe both trying to come to some sort of version of deity that we will love forever, or at least like. And um we played last week week as i mentioned and to me that was our first real play test of mud sword so what i did is i took um if we were to actually make this it won't be called mud sword but <laughs> i experimented last week with uh, osc swords and wizardry and from osc we looked at something called slow weapon and i had joe play and pretty quickly we kind of like we were in one combat with slow weapon. So the slow weapon in OSE is like 200 sword and you go dead last in the round, right? Whether you get initiative or not. So that just did, it seemed like unfun to me. It seemed like right. just unnecessarily picking on the two handed sword wielder. And so that quickly got booted. Right. And what was the big advantage of using a two handed sword? You got a D10 okay. damage. It's okay. not much advantage. To me, that no. doesn't feel like much advantage. No. I literally don't get that. And a crossbow, I think, did a D6 damage. And it was slow. I'm like, why would anybody ever use a crossbow? And I was like, I think to do mathematically, a crossbow, if it's going to be slow, it's got to do D12 damage to me, or 2D6, to be moderately competitive, to be competitive with a short bow. That's if... All weapons are supposed to be equivalent choices. Okay, I agree. And so that's okay to a extent, but here's the deal. Why would anyone use a crossbow? Right, yeah. There's literally no reason to use a crossbow. None. Right, right. You could even go so far as to say they wouldn't exist. It's that. Well, point. no, because you could use a crossbow at range. You can use well, a longbow at range. Sure, 
Sure. Crossbows are easier to things. use. Yeah. There you go. That came to me too. A crossbow. But is definitely... there's no way to really simulate that in game. You could say that no. as fluff in your world, and that's per pretty much how it played out in the what real world. What if you world. gave crossbows a crossbow? Are easy. What if a crossbow got plus two to hit instead of plus one at short range? Plus one at medium and zero. Well, at long. Either way, you're doing more damage. So, which makes sense because. Mm -hmm. Thinking about how crossbows are in the real world, they've got a heavy pull. They can they're better. They're easier. To, they more easily penetrate armor, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, you can give them higher damage. It makes sense, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about weapons like this, not you, the, the general you. When a general you does that. The general you. Um, the problem is, is we we start going into simulation territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you go too far into simulation territory, it becomes a bunch of niggling little details. So, See, you, to me, I, mm -hmm. so you, you, and you, you might end up with the gigantic long list of weapons that where everyone's just slightly different because it makes sense. Quote, right. unquote. So do you say ditching the slow part of a crossbow is fine? Probably. Um, mm -hmm especially if slow means you always go last. Right. Um, if slow meant you roll your your initiative and you make it one worse or one whatever, however it works, mm -hmm. you, it's, it's you're one slower or two yeah. slower, whatever slow would mean, right. instead of just saying dead last all the time. Right. Which means, which is weird. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure if OSC makes it slow or you can only fire every other round. Seems like it was every other round. So these, what we're doing here, folks, is we're discussing our, our, and I want to, I want to limit this to things that we actually play. So I'm not going to bring playing in the mud in as a segment until we played something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? This is not going to be. It's going to be reoccurring, but slowly. So when we've tried something that we wanted, and this is things I wanted to see in play. Um, yeah. So that's interesting. I kind of like the idea of letting a crossbow be fired once every other round, and kind of want to experiment next time letting it do D12 damage. Just to see if anybody really cares, right? Meaning, like, then then you're like, and that's and, and that only making that equivalent to a bow, a regular bow, just so someone might say mechanically, it's worth it to me. And you might what you do, might end up having or uh, characters carry the crossbow, and when they, when you can tell you're getting ready to uh, get it. in danger, you load it and you get it ready and you fire it straight away. And then drop it and switch to another weapon. Which I think is how the crossbow often got used. It, it, it was only, right, right. It's only a one-shot deal, then it was let's go in. You try to kill somebody with it, and then you move in with your sword. Unless unless we're talking pitched battles where you had lots of Yes. If you have like a bank of soldiers and then you had your crossbowmen or your bowmen right. who were fairly well protected, they could get a few shots off before maybe that you had a uh, uh some uh horsemen come around and try to mow them down so right. it all depends on the situation in a yeah, it does. In, in, with a small squads like groups are uh, mm -hmm. probably having the shot ready and then dropping yeah. and switching is probably what you would do i have zero i think that's kind of cool yeah mm -hmm. um we also tried a big change on skill we skills so i i, I tried and a couple of these were swings and misses so the skills thing that i tried um i borrowed from 13th age where your skills are more like I was the king's uh, footman for many years. And so within that, you may have learned some court etiquette. You may have learned how to fight. You may have learned heraldry. A variety of skills you may have learned. Diplomacy, right? And you attempt to barter that into a bonus in the game. And we played about six level characters. And so I took all, I had, I wanted a skill system. And what I gave was, I think everybody had like two skills where they could put up to two or three ranks in it and that was it. Right. And then it got modified. How did I do it? You had to roll, oh, we're trying to use roll under the stat. And so if you were like at an 11, you're making a dexterity check and you could convince me that as the King's footman, you should be very well balanced in this. I say you're trying to, I don't know, walk along a, five inch, four inch ledge, which is fairly good size. And when you make your dex check, you know, as a footman, you had to work really hard on your balance. I mean, that's hard to imagine, but let's say I'm probably like, no, you didn't. But let's say you did. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna make that check. I got an 11. If I got two 
points in that, that 11 becomes a 13, which I believe in OSE was plus one. So then, uh, or th it didn't matter, 13. And then you could roll 13 or under for that check instead of 11 or under. And Joe found the loophole in the problem. Yes, which it was, was, if you have a high stat, mm -hmm. you're always going to make it for that yeah. type of check. So, so almost always. And my character was a wizard or magic user and mm -hmm. had a high intelligence and with the 18. bonus 18 and with the bonus from his background, he always right. succeeded or nearly, I think he always succeeded, but almost always had automatic success Correct. for things that weren't too esoteric. So right. anything uh, that wasn't, didn't give, impose a penalty, just trying to figure it out. Yeah. He automatically knew, which is kind I of weird. It was like, you know, if, you, if there was an arcane secret, because you had some background, something, was it you or the mysteries, or was that Jeff? That, had that was Jeff. My you had something with arcane. I was a college boy. Yeah, and you had learned that, so if you made a check, you would do 18, was it three in your rank? Mm -hmm. So he'd have a 21, so on a d20, that was guaranteed. And unless I used OSC's option of getting penalties, minus four to plus four, some random knowledge, and there was one really rare piece of knowledge that you know this temple had been dedicated to dagon which would have been like over a thousand years ago which would be really rare for joe to have a chance to know even being a smart wizard of sixth level with a minus four he had to roll 17 or under which was still a really really hard to fail really hard to fail I'm like that's you're right and i really want a game where and i have i have already created the next skill system that i'm going to use and i took your suggestion hmm turning it into DCs. And if you give me a second here, Joe is not inclined to give me time, but if I could convince him to sing a song while we wait, that would be- Nobody back. wants to hear me sing. That's probably I true. I guarantee you that. <laughs> but um, I want to take a look because I've made a note, take two on Mudsword. In backgrounds, I'm going to set DCs somewhat like 13th age again. They're going to be easy, which is going to be a 10. Medium is going to be a 15, and hard is going to be a 20. So I'm going to switch to DCs instead of roll under. And I'm going to keep roughly the same skill rank. So you're talking one or two in that. And I'm going to use, it says, these rank skills modify your stats when you make checks that are connected to your backgrounds. And it's going to be based on, on your skill modifier. So in other words, your 18 will be plus three. So Joe might have a plus six to an arcane knowledge roll. And if it's easy, he's gonna need a four or higher. If it's medium, he's gonna need a nine or higher. And if it's hard, it's gonna be a 14 or higher, which that is a little sense. more, which is a little more, and I could still do plus four minus four to the DC if I think it's really esoteric or right. super easy. Yeah, and that, that feels a little better as to what I want the skills to be. Yeah. But I, still, I don't think I would do that very much though, if I was you. What do you mean? To add that additional modifier. If you're already saying this is hard, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do you say? Oh, it's the minus hard? four plus four. Yeah. Right, right. I think it would be if I saw something was. I think I thought there's hard, and then there's something that would be almost no one knows this. And that would be. A, that would really just be a different DC, really. Yeah, a twenty-two. A 20, yeah. Maybe I probably yeah I may not do plus four minus four, but I might do I might but modify. The how would you would do plus four minus four like that would be a situational modifier like you found this esoteric knowledge book. Yes. And you, um, before you encountered this thing that requires you to try to figure it out, so you have this book in your back pocket that you right. picked up three adventures ago, right. uh, Bokov's book of weird stuff. And you're like, oh, I'm going to flip through that and see if that's in there. Maybe right. that gives you an, an extra bonus. And re reward the player with good thinking. So you get a plus one. Yeah. And if you make it, we can say, oh, yeah, that was in the book. Right. I kind of, right. I I, I'm really convinced that the, the dice need to rule all at this point. Yeah. Um, and so I um, am definitely inclined to do something like that's not a bad way to roll. Yeah, I, I'm not thinking I would do modify every check. I'm just saying if there's something I wanted to be like that Dagon check would have been a hard check yeah. and probably would have been harder than even 14. I probably would have made it a 16 because I've been plus two. So a DC 22. And you would have had a shot at it, but not terribly not too, high. Yeah, not too high. So too I, I think that sounds better. My first stab mm -hmm. at that was not great. Um, 
Another thing that we did was wizard spells and elf spells. We, I used a PowerPoint system, which turned out to be way too many PowerPoints. Joe and Jeff both agreed, the players of the wizard and the uh, elf both agreed that it was too many PowerPoints. The elf and, definitely had too many. Yeah, and so my next stab is gonna be an attempt at using the Magister from Arcana Evolved, but OSE spell. So if you're a fifth level spellcaster, I think OSE is like two first, two second, and a third. You're gonna have them as slots because I still want the wizards to have access to all their spells, um, which is gonna add up, mm, crank up the power level a little bit, but not so much that you can cast, you know, seven fireballs. Like how many power points did you have for your wizard? 17. 17. So he so could in have theory, cast five. You could have cast five fireballs as a six level wizard. And you're like, on one level, you can say, that's not the end of the world, but- Because you're done. You're done. But in most adventures, that's going to kill a lot of crap. Yeah. I mean, I know like, that uh, the one encounter that he cast fireball in, yeah, that pretty much turned that encounter into uh, a cakewalk. Kind oh, of. those four harpies, you just, you burned them to a crisp. You know, I don't think you killed any of them, but you no, burned No, I killed two of them. Well, did you with the fireball? Yeah. Okay, and then you burn and you burn the other two, didn't you? No, no, I didn't cast another fireball. I cast fireball no. on two of no. the four, and yeah. the, the other two took some damage. One of them, one of the other uh, two, got killed by dis damage from the other characters. And then the fourth one ran. I think you had him ran, run off. I think the spell points were definitely too generous. I felt like at that level, I was using your modifier. To, I was using the standard single saving throw from OD&D, and I was using your intelligence modifier to modify the DC, which is really buff at that level, because you were plus three, which means you gave a mind. So if someone had a saving throw of 12, it became a 15 against all your spells. Right. So that's pretty awesome. It is. I think if, if I use the progression as shown in OSE, though, quickly, that will not be as awesome. Because nope. people say the throws get really good, but that does mean, as a base, even a high level fighter will have at least a five, which I know is not great, but it's not guaranteed. One through four will be a fail. Now, if they have rings of protection and other stuff, that changes things. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to do with the DC modifiers with the spell well, modifiers. It just means that high level you you cast magic missile a lot and or other spells that don't require saving throw. Which was really awesome in OSC as well. We found the spells. We found the spells in OSC to be really, really good. Charm person. Yes. Holy um, crap! Haste up to twenty-four individuals. How is that not unbelievable? That seems too good. But is it, I don't hit, know. Is it hit dice dependent? I have to look at it. I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. I well, didn't the modifiers may have to be tweaked. What do you think of the plus three, minus three on modifiers? Limiting to plus three, minus three. I think those are fine. I, it's better than the plus one minus one of OD and D. That's kind of a little. It's not enough differentiation. Yeah. Um, I'm toying with more at, at higher ability scores, but I also don't want this game to become. I don't want it to become three E. Right. Where at twentieth level you got a thirty six intelligence. I just don't want to deal with that. Right. You know, if you have a twenty twenty intelligence wizard, that used to be godlike. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like that's pretty powerful enough at high level magicness. Um. So those are some things we played around. Now, the funny, the one thing that I studied the hardest, because all those others were just me toying around with the math a little, not even thinking too hard about it. Um, things I just thought sounded good. I studied cleric turning pretty carefully. And I implemented a turning rule where you would roll D20. And I think... We didn't actually play it, though. No, no, no. So I'm just, I'm just I just want to yeah. tell folks and you what it was. Um Clerics that turned, their check was uh, uh, D20 plus their charisma modifier. And that would be the result on the table. You know, I used a, I used, actually chose, I think I chose basic fantasies turning on dead table because I believe it was the hardest one of all the old school ones that I had. Because I, I think generous. The least generous, because I actually, I think they're too generous. When you look yeah. at the old school, they're way too generous. I actually don't think you should be able to turn liches, period. Um, and you, once you rolled that, you said, look, I can turn up to a zombie. And we're facing skeletons and zombies. Then you would roll 2d6 for the damage. And that would be the number of hit dice that you could affect. 
and it would explode like Savage Worlds. I still like the idea of this. So that means if you roll 2d6, if you roll a five and a six, that's 11, but the six will get to explode and you get to roll the d6 again. And if it's a six again, it explodes. So if you do five, six, six, three, that's 12 plus eight, that's 20 hit dice of undead that have to be zombie or lower. Right. That's my idea. That sounds manageable, mm -hmm. but we'll see. I'm yeah. sure when we play it. And I had some undead in the next part of the adventure we didn't get to, but not a lot. It's funny that I spent so much time. I literally studied all the rules. I read them, reread them all for all the editions that I have and versions and, and OSR variants. And I was like, I don't like this. And turning is once per encounter, which I think is actually great. I don't think you should do multiple turnings. I think it's my power of my holiness against these undead. You can only do it one time. You know, they're not going to be as impressed the second time you flex your holy coolness. To me. Sure. So what do you think? What do you the think only, of that? The only exceptions to that would, I would think, is if um, everything's fine. This last bit, you only do it once around. Mm -hmm. Once a, once a. Encounter. Encounter. Yeah. Should only apply if no new undead. Correct. Get Agreed. added in. Yes. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. I mean, you come into a room, there's 200, there's 20 skeletons. Do your thing. You just you turn 12 of them, but you can't go turn the other eight the next round. Right. But if a couple of whites come rolling in or 10 more skeletons come rolling in, you can make another turn. And right. I'm okay with that even affecting, I'm not going to like delineate, oh, these guys are only attempted once. They're not there. I just say new roll. Mm -hmm. The combat, the encounter has changed. You can try again. I just think turn every round. I'm sorry. It's too good. And I'm going with present yourself boldly. You cannot be in the back. You must be in the front. You must step up right into the grill and say, that back makes spawn. sense. Back spawn of Satan, you are turned. Right. Doesn't mean you got to be right by their face, but you got to be in front, at least up in the front rank with every, front ranks with everybody else, presenting yourself with a target because you're so confident my poop doesn't stink and you're about to run. Right. Because otherwise, if you're doing it from the back of the the group, if if that if that's a clear distinction at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. You're kind of, you know, like face my holy wrath, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And I've got some, um, and the thing I got with the cleric that I oh, didn't get played into, the clerics are going to have a lay on hands ability, which is a point with a resource they get to manage. It's going to be five times their level. And I have a variety of things they can do. I'll talk more about that next time. This really never come into play. So I just wanted to mention that I worked so hard on the turning and I never, never used it. And the adventure should have had, I need to focus my play testing on these rules that I create so we can see how they work. Yes, yes. And so next time I'm going to add turning undead, we're going to have skill checks and stuff like that and let the wizard do some casty cast to see how it goes. Sounds good. All right. So anyway, and that's where I'm at. Did you have any ideas, things you wanted? So you mentioned you want to make sure uh, turn undead. Um, if if maybe the situation, yeah, if situation, the situation can, changes, you get a new attempt yeah sounds good right, depending buddy. on the situation change True. all right good deal um so remember we're going to have a negative material plane answering questions from last uh or answering messages uh from the last oh. session for our last episode the negative material we won't necessarily right. have any new negative yeah. material plane. we may complain about stuff we may not i don't think so uh, we'll i don't think so yeah just chuckle at the chuckle heads Yes. So with that, uh, if you would like to support our show, please get the word out on social media or uh, on the news. If you can get yourself on the news and talk about us, that'd be great. That would be great. National yeah. television news. National television. CNN, Fox, whatever. Yeah. Sure. Drop Biggest Geekus yep. wherever you can. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Share it with your friends. Let them know how good we are. Well, just let, uh, let them make the decision. You don't have yes. to tell them what you think. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we have a lot of ways that you can support us on the uh, web page, but the best one is to share, 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 share. Yes. Check us out on Odyssey and YouTube or anywhere you can get your podcasts, which yep. is, I, you know, I always wonder when we talk about this yeah. because they're already listening to us on a podcast app. Check us out on the one you're listening to us. Yes, on. please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have our email at the geeks at biggest geeks send us a drop us a line 
let us know what emails you think. we read them today so yes. emails will happen yes uh, also check out some of the podcasts and other things that we like that we will include in the show notes anything else you want to say before we sign out and then go go negative no i want to play a whole lot more i'm on vacation play play more. play play, play. All, right. all right this is joe i'm randy and remember if you can't be big like us then be geeks like us All right. So we slip into the darkness. We will slip into the dark side. Okay. Dark side's coming now. Nothing is real. I thought that's where you were going. I thought that sweet melodious voice of yours was leading me to that song. Yeah, except the melodious part. Yeah. Which is not true. Uh, let's see. A little here. lie, but it did sound song like. It sounded okay, except that it, you know, didn't match you gotta, reality. You got a pretty good voice, dude. But I mean, I don't know about singing. Not, I mean, not singing. I think with training, you could be a decent singer. I think with training, I would be told never to sing again. So, are you right, saying so you could make me the best? With my help, you could be the best. Yes. <laughs> I think someone that knows how to sing and teach people how to sing could probably teach you how to sing. Someone that knows how to sing, <laughs> you teach think. people how to sing, could teach me how to not sing. Please don't ever <laughs> sing. <laughs> All right. So we've got some messages regarding the negative plane to, to uh, some voicemails to ring out there. First will be John Allen Large. Hey, you got to put it where I hear it, dude. No, no. Joseph, Stop come on. it. Stop I it. I can't be extra negative. I don't know. If I can't blast John, if I don't know what he said. Stop being particular. Dang it. Where are you at? There. All right. Big John. Got something to say. Hey there guys, it's John here from the Red Dice Diaries. Just started listening to your What Type of GM Are You episode. I'm only at the very start, but you're asking about SpeakPipe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's just a voice mail service. You can sign up to it and you get like a mailbox effectively where people can leave your voicemails of up to 60 seconds, I think it is. It might vary a little bit. I forget the exact amount, but it's always worked pretty well with me. I do know, however, that a lot of people have had issues with it on their mobiles, although since it mainly seems to work from the web interface, that's why I still have people like leaving me messages on Anchor because the SpeakPipe version that works on the phones isn't particularly good, but the web interface is pretty cool. Anyway, I'm going to get back to listening to the episode, guys. Take it easy. So we put this here just because he was like kind of. Well, this is riffing uh, off of our. Um, yeah. Anchor sucks. Anchor, uh, Anchor sucks. sucks. Well, I know I mentioned before I have to. I like to leave messages for John on his website, on my computer, and does better on SpeakPipe, and it's great. It's ninety seconds, by the way, John. It's quite quite nice. Ninety seconds. I like that. It gives me more time to bloviate. That's yes. a word. It's it it is now. No, it's actually a word. Bloviate. Oh, good. <laughs> good shut up <laughs> very nice now shut up yeah she's very smart now shut up that's my movie okay last thing negative material plane yeah i agree the tsr thing was more of a tempest in a teapot but it sure got a lot of people worked up <laughs> but i mean it just goes to show you know these days with all the social media and everybody having all this time on their hands you can't go into business and be a knucklehead it, it you know, those days are gone. I mean, you can go into business and be a knucklehead, but it's going to bite you in the butt real quick. You, you know, you, you you would think they would have learned something, you know, and, and these folks would have learned something, but I guess not. Oh, well. But, yeah. I, I mean, I do agree that if you legally have acquired a trademark, you ought to be able to use it. So I'm interested to see how that plays out a little bit, just, just for curiosity's sake. But... I mean, I wasn't going to buy anything from the new TSR anyway. So to me, it's, you know, not a big deal. Well, I think they're giving up on the uh, trademark. Oh, really? Looks like it. Oh. Their website uh, changed over. It was weird. It changed over. Wonder filled. I Wonder thought I still filed. saw Wonder filled. Wonder filed. Yeah. And they let that Dinehart dude, they blamed everything on the Dinehart dude. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I didn't really look too much into all that. I mean, I I'm still either. blocked. 
by right. the TSL. <laughs> so I can't really read it. So unless I, I there's ways to, but I, uh, uh, it's too much work. So if someone blocks you, they're too quick on the block, dude. Yeah. Look, guys, you can say what you want about Joseph, and I probably would agree he's douche nozzle. But um, yeah, he's inoffensive, brother. Come on now, come on. <laughs> you know, so. I was a little cheeky. Were you cheeky? Okay, a little. They, a little. A little. All right. All right. As for Kickstarters. Don't worry, I have no plans on making doing a Kickstarter. I've until I retire from the job I've got now. You know what? These might have been fine for the regular thing. He, I thought he might have been ragging on Kickstarter. I can't really remember what he said. Okay. That's all right. As long as Jason gets to speak, I'm good. For various reasons, I won't go into. I don't want to have a separate income coming in, and I don't want to have to, you know, justify other money stuff. So for me, making money off my hobbies, kind of off the table at the moment. That's why I'm not trying to monetize anything hobby-wise, uh, other than maybe, you know, selling used games or something, but that's different. But if I was going to do a Kickstarter, it would be a, either the product would be 100% done or it would be like 90% done. Like the PDF would be done, all the text would be done, and maybe I'd do the Kickstarter just like to get art, Right. Or maybe do Kickstarter for art and to hire a professional editor. Because so many of these books really need another two or three passes from a professional editor. At least. And good and a good index. And I, I was like, if this mud sword ever comes to fruition, I think we need to give it away as a PDF first and see what kind of traction we get. And if people, if for some reason people dig it and people talk about it and they talk about a print product, then I'm with Jason. We're gonna have our ducks in a row. We might do a Kickstarter, probably will. And I mean, if, if that happened, and I don't really think it will, because I mean, I don't know. We're not, we're just dipping we're our just toes. Two dudes. We're just two dudes. Yeah. Good point. But editing is a big problem. It's a job and it's necessary and a good index is necessary. But I would have all the other part, all the grunt stuff would be done. All the grunt work would be done and it would need a professional editor and maybe professional art, right? But that's all I would do as far as that. So if for some reason I did a Kickstarter and something crazy happened and I couldn't, for, you know, fulfill a physical product or fulfill exactly what I said I would, people would get the PDF right away. It's like, um, what, what's the, what's the cat that does stars without number and the world's, you know, without number. And mm -hmm. he's done all these projects I'll, I'll think i'll look up his name before the next call but with his stuff you know he sends you a draft when you back his project product you back his kickstarter he sends you the draft copy right there so you've got something in your hand you could use so you're you know regardless you're not out out of pocket all the way that's pretty Dude. cool so many of these that's folks just uh take your money and then you might hear from them later on Maybe. Kevin, his name is Kevin Crawford. I know because I backed World Without Numbers. I'm expecting my hardback book offset print copy very soon. I'm excited to get it, and I'm, I just want to jump in there before, before Jason says it. <laughs> Kevin Crawford is the author I'm thinking of, and like I, I have zero head, hesitation of backing anything he does because he's got it most. He's got a lot of it done before he puts Kickstarter up, and he. Um, like I say, he even shares drafts during the Kickstarter. So you know the product is there. And that's definitely the model I would use if I was going to do a Kickstarter. The Just about everything would be done. And there would, if nothing else, any backer would get, you know, all the backers would definitely get PDF copies if nothing else. And, you know, I've backed Kickstarters in the past where it failed to fund. And so they didn't finish it, but they still sent PDF copies out to all the backers, you know, say, hey, thanks for backing me anyway. So that was kind of cool. Um, and, you know, I backed 350 different projects since I started using Kickstarter. I, I just checked, and that's how interesting it's a round number. Maybe it's time to stop doing Kickstarter now that's a round number, right? Maybe. I need to check, I need to check mine. I've done a lot. I've just done a few. And to be, uh, to be honest, I think if we – we're at the stage where we could kickstart. I'd want to do it privately because why give Kickstarter our money? Oh, that'd be interesting. Just crowdfund on our own. Yeah. People do it all the time. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. 
so what the, the 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 good thing about kickstarter is they have something for you you just put it there but the right. bad thing is they get a piece of it right. the good thing about doing it yourself is you get all of it mm -hmm. but you have a lot of work to do yeah you do And not all those were RPGs. I mean, a heck of a lot of those are board games and board game expansions. And then there's a handful of other things in there. But the quality of Kickstarter stuff is up and down. But like I say, the editing and a lot of these, they're rushing to get stuff out. And you see it in board games too with rule books. But with RPGs, the, you know, they're not editing these things. They're pu just pushing them out. And then if you get a hard copy... You know, look at the errata. You know, the, the, you know who's bad on this? R. Towson, the, the friggin' Witcher RPG and Cyberpunk Red. Both those the hard copies come out. You get the hard copy, but then there's a shitload of errata. It's crap. It, it really ticks me off. The lack of editing I see in modern RPGs, especially Kickstarter ones, is really frustrating. Maybe I will stop with 350 um, things. Well, I don't know. If they do DCC X Crawl, I'm going to have to back that. So maybe it'd be 351. It's an engine. Uh -oh. Yes, Jason, you will be back. And then so will Joe. I don't care what he says. I'm getting his money and I'm putting it in. I'm going to go over his house and steal his money and put it in there for him. My it's first car had a 351 Cleveland in it. A, um, it was. What happened? Did we lose him? No, I just paused it because that looked weird. Because he, okay. um, he, he, it looked, it seemed like it was, uh, here, I'll just keep playing it. It okay. got cut off. Right? Ah. So the message ended as if it cut him off, and then it started in a weird spot to me. Okay. I will start it over again, and we'll just go with it, see how yeah, it turns out. Voice. My first car had a 351 Cleveland in it. A, um, it was a, I think it was a Cleveland, not the Windsor. I think it was a 351 Cleveland. Anyway, a Ford LTD station wagon. That thing was a boat, man. That was like a 70-something Ford LTD station wagon. That thing was a boat. It got over 100 miles an hour on the highway, though, back then, many years ago. Um, that was a good car, awesome. man. I wish was it, Joe? It. Oh, well. Anyway. Dude, a Ford LTD, Jason. My man, I had a 78 Ford LTD. It was my first car. It was my mom's car. Remember that? Yeah. The boat was the way we described it. The way we described it. It was awesome. It wasn't a station wagon, but it was a, it was a hoss. Yes, it Sorry. was. Sorry. Is that where, is that uh, the car we rode to in to, to IUS? In yeah. Where IUS or did I, you have a different while car? Right? IUS, we went to um, that's Indiana University Southeast and then uh, went to Kings Island in it. Yeah, dude, mm -hmm. yeah, we did a lot of riding that big boy. Great show, keep up the great work, and I will talk to you later. Yeah, I guess he got cut off and didn't pick up where he left off somehow. That's okay, he was answering it's a weird I don't call, know. but we can count on him. Yeah. And I think putting them, I think putting these at the negative plane is a good idea just because, you know, it could lead to different discussions of like, he was kind of, he was hitting Kickstarter pretty hard, you know, and we do too. So it's cool. Yeah. And I don't mind. I, I agree with him. Yeah. If, if I know the game company or person yeah. puts out good stuff, I'm more inclined to kickstart, but if it's a brand new group of folks, uh, I sight unseen is really bad news. Yeah, we had mentioned before, too, is like, you know, Monty Cook, while we're not down with the type of games he's making now, you can count on it, dude. Mm -hmm. if Cook is doing a Kickstarter. First of all, he's going to get a million bucks, it seems like. And he's going to, I mean, he does get his PDFs. deliver. Fast. Oh, I got the, remember, we got the Strange, like, I got those stuff really fast. Mm -hmm. That was quick. Yeah. All right. So that's it for Jason. Here comes Andy, our number one, number one fan. Rock on. Hi, Randy and Joe. It's Andy, just doing my uh, weekly call-in, or bi-weekly probably now. Um, yeah, COVID and and why um, why people are so freaked out by it. It's about our... It's not about politics. It's not about media. It's about the humans... Um, the human um, failure at understanding, calculating risk properly... We are terrible at it because we aren't actually driven by the numbers. The numbers are meaningless. It's about the emotion and the um, novelty of, of the risk, uh, the rarity of the thing that we're uh, experiencing. And I'll give some examples. And, and the person that compares it to World War II is just, just uh, an idiot. 50 million people died in World War II. 
So, uh, yeah, no comparison. Um, I think I'm not sure if we discussed this particular issue on an episode. Which yeah. issue? The risk um, assessment. Thing. No, but it's cool. It's a good discussion. I, I, I know we've talked about it between the two of us because I know yes. I've mentioned it. Yes. But I don't know if we've brought it up in a negative material. Maybe, maybe, not. Maybe, but maybe he's, not. He's, but yeah, he's, Andy's he's, clearly riffing off some of our comments on COVID. And I think he he makes a I'm, I'm looking forward to his examples, but I, my gut says that's a good, that's not a bad, that's, that's part of it. That's part. Um, and I think that uh, he's true as far as the mob, the, the, the majority, a lot yeah. of people, there are a lot of us that are okay with how to assess risk because well, we didn't freak out. Yes. But um, I think he's got a, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to gauge. I don't know how you would statistically verify this. I just know anecdotally, a lot of people I know got a little squirrely with that when they shouldn't have. Right. But, but, but Andy, finish. We're interrupted. Hit it, Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. You skipped. Yeah. 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 But yeah, the uh, perception of risk, calculating risk, the, the um, statistic, <laughs> which yeah, statistic that we are most often pointed towards is air travel air travel versus car travel so your chance of dying in an air crash um is is something like in your lifetime in your entire lifetime is is something like one in seven thousand five hundred that sounds bad doesn't it but your your chance of dying in a car crash is one in 88 you've got a more than one percent chance of dying in a car crash um, to change it, to put it in, in slightly different terms, you could fly for 14,000 years and and never die. Okay? 14,000 years. Um, you don't have to drive for 88 years to die, um, potentially. I've not seen those numbers, but I know he's not, if he's off at all, it's not by much. Probably not. Air traffic I've seen, I've seen, is pretty safe. It is pretty safe. He's pretty much nailed it, Andy. Sorry, I'll correct that. You'd have to drive for 190 years. So, so yes, you're not likely to die in a car crash either. But, but 25% of Americans, I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you guys, 25% of Americans are scared to the point of anxiety about flying. Now, there is no correlation between that anxiety and the true risk. We should be much more scared of getting in our cars every day because you've got a reasonable chance of dying in your car every time you get in it. Not a big chance. It's just a pretty tiny chance. But the chances of dying the next time you take a flight are so small, you might as well not worry about it. And yet, people change their lives and behaviors. Apparently, air, uh, car accidents went up massively after 9-11 because people stopped flying. And they chose to drive instead. And so they died in, the, in car crashes in increased numbers. That's how stupid humans are, really. You know, he's, yeah, he's, look, a buddy of mine, uh, I won't name his name because I'm going to ask him. He did a TED Talk on risk analysis, and he's a math dude. Um, I'm going to watch it again, and then I'm going to ask him if I can pimp it out here on the show next time because Andy might find it interesting if nobody else does. Because uh, it's crazy how much we... But I also, here's the thing. I think there's a reason for it. I think people in general, and again, I can't prove this, but it's just from my life, lived, ex, my lived experience, Joe. So it's my truth. <laughs> We're more affected by testimony than we are data. Oh, sure. Someone says. Because it plays. Dad died in a car, in, a, in an sure. airplane crash. Yes. I don't drive, I don't ride in an airplane. He's right. I think Andy's right on this. Right. I mean, I'm not going to, I can't back his numbers. Advertising. That's how advertising yeah. works. Yeah. A lot. They don't just they present play. data to you. They give you stories. And that's where I would go against what Andy said initially. I do think politics and media prey on that. Now, Andy's reason could be our root cause, but I think media and people, they prey on that stuff. They know it. They know that. Sure. Yep. The thing is, uh, the media, politicians, they're all people too. So sure. there are some of them that are uh, as fearful as all the fearful people we know. Yeah, and I'm, I'm and not lumping. Yeah. yeah, and there are others that uh, 
are just using it because you see politicians tell people to be scared and then they go have dinners with people and not be socially distanced or wear a mask uh, yeah. when they're telling everybody else that they can't have dinners with each other. I do wonder, I bet there's some of the, I mean, there are people are people too. Some of the politicians do it, not yeah. in, not insidiously, Joe. Right. They believe it. Yeah, they believe you know, it. So to, give, so to give a nod the other way, they're genuinely scaring people, even though they think it's fine because they should. So that's a slight move and like less frustration with those people. I'm like, I feel sorry for them. Why are you so afraid? But yeah, true. Good point. I like these calls. They're good. Interesting. Let's see. I think, I think so you're I'm, on three. I just did three. Ch ch play three one more time. Start at three again. Sorry, I'll correct that. You'd have to drive for 190. Yeah, yeah. you played it. Yeah, perfect. Which, by the way, oh, I want to mention, I'm glad he hit that. Yeah, one out of 190 is still a whole lot bigger than what the plane was. A lot. Yeah. I would be interested better. in seeing the statistics. And when he says over your whole lifetime, I wonder how that is figured. Yeah, probably. It's, what, it's, it's, a different, it's a different statement to say my chance of dying in this particular plane crash and a, the chance of dying if I flew in a plane every day of my life over a course of years. Well, yeah. Well, you also have to. Well, you would look at the only thing you could do is look at data over a person of your. I would say your means, financial means, your demographics, uh, demographics, and has an average lifespan of blah. They drive this many times. They have an average, you know, an average amount of time. Then you could average it out and do some projective statistics. You can make some projections, and there'd be certain levels of, of, um, you know, error. But they would be relatively accurate in the, in the aggregate right. overall, especially with however many billion people are on the earth and sure, or sure. the U.S. alone or in Europe and your U.S. It'd be very similar. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, the other piece of this is some of the fear. I don't. Who knows how much of the 25% of the people who don't want to fly because they're scared is a clinical issue uh, rather than just, you know, not understanding risk. It's probably a percentage. Um, and even he said, maybe it's, well, Joe, if you're afraid, if you're that afraid, it's probably going to become a clinical issue. It might, it might be, <laughs> I mean, uh, you can, it might be, can't, can't you, you can you can be scared and avoid things without it being a clinically diagnosable if sure. someone if someone puts you in a plane you're not going to have a heart attack you're just gonna like what are you doing yeah these sort of things are very hard they're challenging yeah. to measure it's like yeah all the and i challenge someone to tease out um irrational fear mm. uh media manipulation political manipulation going along to get along uh, all of that stuff in this yeah. in this whole thing try to tease that out of the at uh, the aggregated uh, um um yeah. fear porn that's or not fear porn the aggregated uh amount of people who just go with the you got to be scared narrative so right. uh, who's what percent no. that'd be hard to tease out yeah so anyway it's the same with covid and it doesn't matter what the flu statistics are. Yes, people die of flu every year. People die of worse diseases in more horrible ways, but in less smaller numbers. COVID is like the perfect storm. It's just enough deaths to 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 be significant, to be truly significant. It's had a huge impact on the world, and um, and and it's kind of affecting everyone and it's and it's visible and it's and it has an emotional impact and it places you in a political camp so the whole thing is it's almost engineered to create this situation it could have been if some evil genius like had made this thing in a lab which they didn't uh this would have been the perfect thing to make the perfect thing to make to fuck up the world that's why there's so many conspiracy theories out there i think sorry for swearing and um yeah see ya well Two things, evil genius making it a lab, probably not. Uh, made in a lab is the probably. is the number one theory right now with even the folks in the government. So yeah, I think it's um, likely. And if I had to put money down on four or five options, that's where my money would go. I'm not I'm saying not, I'd bet a ton of money. I wouldn't bet my paycheck, but I bet some bucks it was a lab made thing. Yeah, I got out of control. From everything I've heard. 
and this isn't from conspiracy theorists and by the no. way that's a horrible argument and beneath mm -hmm. anybody who tries to just say that's conspira conspiracy theory just ignore mm -hmm. it not yeah. an argument right um the structure of the covid virus itself suggests it being engineered not that some pangolin and some bat had sexual relations <laughs> right we don't know how and some dude ate a bat that ate the leftovers yeah i mean i don't know maybe it was an engineer but it sure smells and looks like it well where it originated from there's a lab yep that engineers them for coronavirus That's their job a coronavirus lab a coronavirus lab life. that does gain of research function that engineers viruses so based on probability not for use on. on the public but no, for, for I'm just saying research. based on prob raw probability of what you can actually figure out, it probably was. And by probably, I just mean it's the highest percentage, which may be really small. I'm not a bio biochemist. I don't know what all the different ways, you know, viruses can leak out. But thanks, Andy. I, I love that call. That was good. I yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Very cool. Thanks to and Jason. That, Ron. Yeah, it was cool. Thanks to everybody who called in. And I do have one, little, I have one little snippet of uh, oh. complaints here. I okay. want to get on the soapbox. So um, I don't know. Remember the dude, I want to say his name was David Kwan, who got really upset about Oriental Adventures last year. I don't remember the name, but I remember the situation. On the conservative RPG side, he's been hired by Watsy now. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd like that. That's I hilarious. Like, I knew you'd like that. Yeah. And so, it's, yeah. it's just figures. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So there you go. Just more. More stuff of dumber, dumb, dumbitude. But hey, you know, that's the one more reason to not buy their crap. Their companies, they're leaving us. Um, oh, well, that's okay. Yeah. OSR seems to be willing to accept us with warts and all, all the problems we have. They seem okay with us. So at least the ones we met, we met some good folks here. And whether I'm in OSR or just doing my own thing, it don't matter. And I got a lot of books and a lot of games I can play for more than my lifetime. Yeah. So. so. Yeah, it's all good. Do, I don't, do they, you, Watsy? You do. They you. won't miss my money, and I won't miss their games. That's correct. Perfect. Win win. Blood Sword is the hit of the future. Be yes. prepared. They are so jelly. They are jelly. No <laughs> peanut butter, just jelly. Okay, dude. I think we're good then, unless you've got something you want to just. I don't think so. Here. I don't have air in this room, so I'm starting to sweat. Yeah, I'm getting warm. It was kind of warm and sticky. Me. It wasn't terribly hot like in the low 80s, but it was sticky as crap. And yesterday was kind of sticky for a low 70s. I day. got really uncomfortable outside, so shut your mouth. Well, Joe, I wasn't because I was in air conditioning most of the days. But, you know, I'm a teacher and I don't really have to work, which is sweet. I mean, I got a good gig, so that's not true. Yeah. Work, just not as hard as this guy. Yeah. Not as hard as most of my friends. So. But you make more. So there's that. Uh, that seems fair. Uh, oh, wait a minute. That's not fair. That's not right. There's something wrong with that. So, oh well. So the way it works. No biggie. Okay, we good. Yeah. All right, bud.